after looking at that highway project, the one bright light. Especially if it's like vintage or older stuff, or like I, I'll look at something that's like 20 years old. And go, oh, I remember that when I was a kid or when I was younger. Yeah. Let me get my pen. I mean, my. Sometimes I watch people. I call them Yeah. Yeah, I got hung out on the landscaping videos with the wife about a month ago, and now we have a three lawn tree. It's all pitching on the I will, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll do it. All righty, thanks you. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> My voice to work. Um, we will jump right into public comments. Public comments. Uh, Participants, excuse me, public participation is welcomed and invited to the city council meetings. Time is reserved at each regular meeting to, for those audience who wish to address the city council. <clears throat> the city requests that persons addressing the city council refrain from speaking personal, slanderous, or profane, <clears throat> disruptive remarks. Public comments is not intended to be a question and answer period in conversations with council or staff. 
council members when recognized by the mayor may ask questions of the presenter, but no action may be taken at city council by the city council during the public comment section of this meeting. Under the Brown Act, the council, city council is prohibited from discussing or taking action on any item not listed in the post in the agenda. So if there's any public comments at this time that doesn't pertain to what our strategic planning session is about, this is a time to come up and speak. If it's something about the planning, strategic planning session, then there'll be time for people to comment on each on each topic. So is there any public comments at this time? Not related to strategic planning. All right, we will go right into what we're on here. So this is um, this is a project list. Who's going to start off here with review and discussion on the capital operating project list? So. Yep, this is the city manager, Jason Ledbetter. We're going to start with a brief slideshow and just discuss strategic planning and what we're doing here tonight. And um, Retta, if you don't mind moving on to the next slide. So real quickly, too, I'd like to say that, you know, we're going to go through, you're going to go through all this slideshow, correct, first? Yeah, we're going to go through a portion of this slideshow, which will lead specifically into this project list, where we will then have the department head, the, the, the ones that are available. Uh, so the director of public works will come up and he will go through infrastructure. And if you have specific questions about the list at that time, or if you want more information about where we stand on that project, uh, Mr. Bray will provide that information uh, if we currently have it. And then we will slide into planning. Uh, and then we have three other topic areas where we will have the department head or myself be able to give you that information. Some of the projects you may not have questions on which is uh, completely okay. But, uh, and then we're going to save the urban campground for the very end. I do want, since we have all five of you in the room together, I wanna to take some time to discuss that. And uh, so, yeah, you'll get to go over each individual project tonight. I just wanna clarify that with everybody so they know that we're gonna be going through all this and there'll be a time for the, for the public to speak on each topic too, just so everybody knows out there. Well, my preference would be that we save the public input till the very end Correct. after we, uh, when we start diving into the urban campground after the discussion at the council, then we would field public comment if that's okay. Mr. Mayor, yes. Councilman McCoy, can we note that there will be no decision votes made tonight? Correct. Okay. Only direction given. Only direction given, but this, yeah, not a, it's just a planning right. meeting. Okay. Right, it's Thank a you. workshop, right. And so tonight we're gonna go kind of backwards because I have been here just over five months. We have a lot of new department heads uh, in the organization. And so stepping in, there were already a number of projects as you are aware uh, that were council driven and some that were staff driven and eventually approved by the council. So we're gonna go through that and we're gonna work backwards as though we're doing a strategic plan for the existing projects. And really the goal here is if we get through this meeting tonight, if we don't require another meeting to finish this topic, we would come back in January after the uh, council is set for the following year, and we would go over goals to then look at building projects around the vision of the council. And so, my goal here tonight, one of them, is that at seven o'clock we should we should go ahead and wrap it up. This should just only take two hours, and if needed, if we're not able to complete this um, presentation, we will come back in early August to go back over the items that we missed here tonight. Uh, so we will review the full project list and the my vision for you and this is at your discretion is once we break into strategic planning session one in january that we would build something from 23 to 26 and we would lead into our budgeting process for the 23 24 year with a strategic plan and the budget that matched that strategic plan so next slide please So part of the reason that we're doing this is just to provide the public and also to provide the council more in-depth information on the workload that we currently have. And I will be completely honest, at this very moment, I have personally reached capacity. 
And so I also want to showcase with the department heads that it is also my professional opinion that the staff is at current capacity and that we would like to focus on getting some of these projects completed before we start piling on new projects to this list. Uh, we're also going to give you the opportunity to know or ensure that the projects are staying on track, um, an opportunity to define expectations, and then even also reprioritize based off the list, based off the information you hear tonight. Maybe there's a project we're not aware that's more important to you, uh, and you can give us that guidance tonight. Next slide. <clears throat> so what is strategic planning, in my opinion? Uh, it is when we get to January, more of a 20,000 foot view where goals would be prioritized with the council and we would do some workshops over the course of a few months where goals would be thrown out, written on a board, and then we would whittle the, in a perfect world, we'd whittle those goals down to say five goals and then all of the projects, we would then come back to you saying based off of your goals, here are a number of projects where funding is available or we internally have funding. And these are the projects we recommend. They may not align with your guys's guidance and you would redirect us to add projects that align with your guidance. But then we would lead right into the budget with a plan that match the budget and should also take into consideration all of the master planning that has been done or that will be done and which also gives even more credence to our planning director's general plan process right now. So thank you very much. So now we are going to jump right in with uh, Mr. Bray and we will start with the first item on the project list. <coughs> and please, this is relatively informal for the council. So if you would like more information about one of these projects as Matt gets to it, uh, please, please let us know. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Matthew Bray, Director of Public Works. Um, as Jason explains, I guess I'll dive right in uh, line by line. I'll give a quick little update of where we are. And if you have any questions, um, stop me mid-sentence and we'll discuss them. Uh, so Public Works, we're infrastructure folks. So we're gonna dive in the flood hazard reduction project that we're all aware of. At the moment, we have the contract paperwork in, back to the hands of the appraisal company, which um, responded to our RFPs and they have taken that paperwork to their board because they're a large corporation and they are in the middle of figuring out who's going to sign for that company. Then we'll get that back from them here, hopefully soon. It'll head back to Dawn at legal. We'll double check it one more time and then go out and start appraising properties all over town, but pretty much we're focused on the willing seller on the north end of town for the flood hazard reduction project. And we hope to spend as much of that available grant funding as we possibly can. Questions on FHR? Just a couple because, um... Janae stopped by the shop today and mentioned that the maintenance 2600 permit is still not current. 16, 1600? Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. Still working on that. We had uh, consultants on board helping us get through that because it used to be a two page paper and now it's two binders full. So, yeah, still forward progress, but it's taken a long time. We're seeing other cities in the state with the same problem. Um, but forward progress is made, and I can update you on that <clears throat> further at the next meeting. And have you kept in touch with uh, Mr. Mosier because he has um, been emailing me to ask what was going on. May I have refer him to you? Sure, I do owe the uh, committee another update. There just hasn't been anything to update since the last update. So it's, we haven't made any really great strides <clears throat> on that side because we're waiting on the appraisal paperwork. Okay. Uh, yep. Thank you. I and we, and uh, Mr. Bray, we also have uh, next summer, is it? Some actual construction, right. is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, we have the East Lennox parcel in design right now with uh, GeoServe engineer. So. Green Orange Disc Golf Course, um, you'll be seeing that at the next meeting. Um, it's without getting too deep because it is in the next agenda on the 21st, 
um, a group of local disc golfers has uh, contacted me over the last month or so. We've worked through, come up with a proposed course, um, come to a draft MOU between, they're, they're not a, a nonprofit yet, but they're in the process of it. And so um, we're definitely gonna wanna get some additional input on that from the SGPGA. Um, I'll reach back to them again and, and make sure there that so, and it's very light installation. Um, if you've walked the trails in the last year or so, the, the mastication efforts and the thinning for fire break up there uh, removed a lot of the ladder fuels up. If you're on the Buckaroo Trail and that you look up and you can actually see for a hundred yards or so. So nice. now you can see the mountain lion coming at you. Yeah. Instead of jumping out of the tree. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you'll see that on the next agenda. Critical infrastructure ordinance. Um, again, today we were cranking on that with the with Dawn and <clears throat> tidied it up from the public works side. I know all, all of the departments are touching it, but I got my final review comments with Dawn today. Yes, thank you. Uh, Main Street asphalt and paving for Caltrans. They had a tentative date of June 22 to begin. Um, I'm hearing rumor that may be pushed out but um, I don't have solid information to share on that. That would have to come directly from Kerry Moles, the project manager. And I haven't had a need to be in direct contact with, with Kerry on that level. Um, and that, so I'll just touch on that because that's coming after we get our water done. Main Street beautification project. You recall the multiple conversations that council had about that. Um, the maintenance agreement is the point that's being worked on now. Yeah. Do you want to add to that, Jason? Yeah, since we're we're negotiating uh, within close session with that particular topic, I think that's probably good enough sure. for a public meeting. Okay. Uh, the existing streetlight relocation that was solved um, initially. We had estimates of about a half a million dollars of city funds to be expended relocating the city owned streetlights, which are on Highway 3. There's a number that we own, there's a number that the state owns. Um, and we worked that through over a couple of years. And finally, the state decided to take that on the relocation, the design, the engineering, all of that. So they're taking our existing lights and moving them back out of the way of their project. Uh, STIP programming, Ben and I have been working on what we call streets camp, looking into future years, not only for Chip Seal, but what streets we really need to get programmed into the STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Program. Um, so we're looking towards the next round. As Jason alluded to earlier, we are full capacity right now with projects. Um, we do have next spring on South Oregon. That is a STIP project, but we need to get back in the barrel on programming. Um, we have a number of streets that we all know. We, we drive them, you know, Knapp Street, Lenox Street, a lot of those. They have to be STIP eligible. So they have to meet the certain criteria. We can't just put in for STIP money and put it anywhere we want. It has to go on specific roads. So um, that's where we are on STIP. The Main Street water system improvements is what we're doing and getting in your way right now. Um, the sewer is pretty much tidied up, but the, the water system we've hit Midtown and the Allen Gill construction is just cooking. They are making great time. Uh, of course, with anything like that, sizable water, we designed it around what we knew, what we had mapped. Some of these maps are from the 1920s. Um, some of the pipes are from the 1920s. So there's some businesses and homes along Main Street that we've taken out of water unknowingly so when we, we flip them to the new section of pipe that we just put in after the chlorination level come back and somebody's out of water. And so we've been chasing a lot of that. Um, we're working kind of through the Howard. We had some issues in the Howard area, the intersection there. Had another call this morning about it. So, and then we expect another hitch in our giddy up when we hit Rose Lane but it should be fairly smooth sailing between where they are now down to rows and then we're going to have some hiccups I but it's going you. great alan gill is great to work with as a company i gotta tell you i'm really impressed it, it's a nuisance with all the construction but those guys have been really pleasant and efficient at putting those cones out 
I've taken out one cone, but <laughs> <laughs> it's. Oh, I, I came to work the other day. There was a pile of about six of them by my truck. So somebody was shopping, bringing them back. It was great. But yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. So so you are aware that it, we are working in the state highway, and so Allen Gill has an encroachment permit through Caltrans um, for all of it, plus the traffic control. But with all of these hitches in our giddy up, we're just midday shuffles to get things around it. It's going to get uglier. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the sewers off. So that's the water. <clears throat> East Lennox water line and water treatment plant filter improvements. I don't know if anybody's attempted to get up Lennox lately. Um, <clears throat> They flew through this project. They, the tie from Main Street was uh, difficult to schedule because we had the sewer crew going through, we had the water crew coming through, and then the, the crews that were taking the water up Lennox. Um, so that we got through that initial, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how do we get this out of here? And then they started running east up Lennox and that's stubbed in. They hopped over the freeway and started at uh, Foothill. I don't know if anybody saw it, but there were huge, a huge uh, bore pit with the shoring boxes. And so they bored up underneath the railroad tracks and down and then just pulled the line all the way to the east side of the freeway. We've got the line laid out there, the pipe that's going to get pulled underneath, bore jacked underneath I-5. So they're going to set up another bore pit on East Lennox and pull that pipe that's laying on the gutter in the ditch right now. That's yeah. the piece of pipe that'll go under the freeway. East Lennox already has some of this, right? Because it goes up past Crematorium. So Crematorium. Right, that section's in, that line yeah. is in, and then the other side of the freeway, it's in all the so way to Maine. All I have to do is come in and pull that, well, just have to just pull, pull it under it the freeway. That's quite a it's task. like 300 and something feet of board yeah. jack. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I'll let you know when that's gonna happen because that's something to like, or put a hard hat on and go stand that's there for cool. 20 minutes. And then the water treatment plant filter improvements is a portion of that job from that funding source. It's, we lumped the two projects into one. Um, so they're doing some filters and under drain work and stuff out there on Egger Road. Uh, uh, water supply and storage improvements, SRF. That's cranking away at 90% plans received on review. That is a large project and it would take me quite some time to explain. This is tanks, this is additional tanks. Um, predominantly the replacement of the uh, Laurel Lane tanks, which a lot of folks don't know we even have tanks up there. There's three little tiny tanks tucked up behind that subdivision that was you know, built and then eventually annexed into the city. So it's, uh, we get an, a lot of extra water storage up there and then some rehab on some tanks over on the uh, north end of town. Klamath Dam removal, I think I've briefed you during previous meetings that the 100% plan set for our water line crossing at Iron Gate Lake has been approved by the city. Um, and so they, they sent that off, uh, I think just last week, I got the final, final, here it is drawing. And we got all of the protections we asked for, for the water line. It's going to hang on a bridge. Yeah, would you go over that because it changed a few times? So. It changed a lot of times. Remember, <laughs> it changed so much you didn't want to talk to him. About, you yeah. didn't want to hear from me about it anymore. Um, so the final is a bridge okay. that came on late. They weren't going to re replace the bridge, but they are. So they're hanging it on the downstream side of the bridge, fully armored underneath. We upsize the thickness of the wall of the pipe to take almost all the way up to 50 cal bullets that was a, a, a big concern because our tanks do get shot on the regular they used to dent our tanks when you shot it with a 30-06 or something smaller now they pierce it because they're all copper so we use yeah. if you look at the Don't tanks up down. on green up on uh, humbug they're all dented from people shooting them with 22s and all that but now they now they go through because yeah. they took our lead away from the will, from that so matt you say it will not withstand a 50 cal though it yeah. The ballistics on the pipe thickness we chose go up to 50 cal, which is the biggest rifle anybody around here is going well, yeah, yeah, to have so they, in their yeah. gun safe, hopefully. 
Yeah. Yeah, shouldn't be shooting in there. Yeah. Right. Different yeah. colors. And then shielded it. Yeah, and then shielded it with some aluminum stuff. It could be painted the same color as a bridge, so you just won't see it. It looks like a, a structural member of the bridge when it's done. And it meets all of our hydraulic curves to meet our pump pressures, and it doesn't affect the cost of our pumping. So we got it down there. Raised it up enough to where the, when you talk FEMA floodplain, you know, I talk about it a lot, but FEMA has a hundred year floodplain, which is a model of what happens in a specific area, typically urban, where this is what floods and that's why you have to pay the insurance um, or not. In far reaching areas as Iron Gate Lake, there's not really a FEMA floodplain design. So we asked politely that they create the best model they could. And then we negotiated with their engineers the height that we were comfortable with because when we do get the floods on the Klamath River, there are trees and floating debris that could wipe out pipe and or the bridge. And so, I mean, all of those details were worked out and the city got everything we asked. And it only took three or four years. It was yeah. um, the hatchery design coordination. This is the proposed hatchery that they want to fire back up at the, if you've been to the headworks of the water treatment plant or water of our water at Fall Creek. It's that flat down below that has the picnic tables and the old, the old hatchery. So that's the, uh, their proposal is to put in a new one there, operate it for seven years, repopulate that stretch that was denuded of fish because of the dam installation and then decommission and or move the dam. That's the short story. That's the plan. Water rights discussions, those are always um, ongoing. I don't think I really need to get too deep into that. Main Street sewer interceptor, we, Public Works, I only made it out there for about 20 minutes, had a uh, inspection yesterday for substantial completion of the Main Street sewer interceptor project. So Rob Taylor, Ben Miller, when he could be there, he's a little bit, he's a chip ceiling this week, went through with the, uh, all of the, the site observers and the contractor from SNL and made the final punch list to come back through and tidy up what needs to be done. Um, some of the trench patching, some manhole rings that needed to be altered a couple inches, things of that nature. So we're at final punch lists, substantial completion. That is a huge project. That is, that is something that we dreamt up and put in a master planning about eight or 10 years ago. And I thought I would never see it in my career and we have it it's it's an amazing upgrade i know we were in everyone's way but that portion is done burgess wastewater collection system this one's in the barrel um i think i've spoken to this in previous meetings also but basically the burgess street area was when i5 came through the state relocated homes that folks wanted relocated and they plopped them down there in the burgess street area some of them are right on top of old sewer lines. Uh, some of the lines are in the street, some of them are not. We're fixing all of it. And then we're gonna pave back as much as we possibly can with available funding on top of that infrastructure project as is RMO. If we do infrastructure work, we like to pave back as much as we possibly can. Um, obviously they give us the money within these grants to patch back the trench. And then the city's looking for additional funding pots to pull from to do the shoulders of the road. So if you have a six foot, you know, trench down the middle, then we're looking for funding to, to do the rest of that. So, and it's great. That is a, a wonderful project. I've been contacted for 10 years by the folks that live in the neighborhood about the streets. And I've always been concerned about the sewers in that neighborhood. So it fixes both of those problems. And uh, in a couple of years, it'll be nice and shiny and, and new. It's a big one. Um, task orders for the wastewater plant. This is SCADA. This is the electronics that we have at the water treatment plant. So my water operators can actually turn valves and run the plant from their cell phone anywhere they have coverage. They can be on the beach in Hawaii and send some water into Wairika from Fall Creek. High limit alarms um, on that side, they've got all of the, the chlorine alarms and all of that. It's all built in to get a text. It's just seamless. We're doing that to the wastewater treatment plant. We're headed into planning on that. Is um, there an override for manual control if necessary? Yep. Thank you. Yep. 
on all of it. And just, just recently we were running, uh, Roy Hathaway, our water manager was not getting a lot of sleep because we had lost internet um, service out there at the headworks. And, uh, well, we had a link at the filter plant on Egger that we lost service to. And so we were run, we've actually been running manual probably for about a month. The guys were actually driving back out to Fall Creek like we used to 10 years ago before we got skated and opening and closing valves by hand. It was kind of kind of a step back in time. Just, yeah, well, where are you today? I'm in Fall Creek. I don't really go out there that much anymore. It was pretty, so we're doing that at the wastewater plant. So then that side, we get the high level limit alarms and we get all of that built into it, all the electronic valving and all that. And the, the wastewater plant has never had any of those upgrades. It is exactly as it was when we built it. So uh, Mitch and our, our sewer, our wastewater treatment plant manager is excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and as am I. Uh, stormwater master plan and rates. Uh, Assistant city manager Retta took this one off of my desk. Thank you, Retta. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough because I never would have got around to it. She slammed that one through with the NCE contract. This is a multi prong project that touches all of town. Um, without going too deep, we do our streets with our general fund, we pay our cops with the general fund, we run our parks with the general fund, and we're supposed to take care of stormwater with the general fund. That doesn't work, it's not feasible. So the end of this, one of the end points is rate studies and what would it cost? Um, that's, you know, not really public works. So I'm really glad Reddit took it over. Yeah. Uh, I did um, on the bottom of that waiting for MS4 letter. I, I sent an email to Jason this afternoon. I don't know if you saw it, I sir. Did. Thank you. Yep. Um, I was contacted by my contact at the state water board who had verbally expressed a number of months ago that the waiver letter that we sent for the MS4 compliancy was likely to be granted, which would get us out of millions and millions of dollars of compliancy. And not only the city, like the trash capture compliance portion of that permit was $12 million to put in cap trash capture devices at the outfalls of our storm into the creek. That alone was 12 million. This waiver letter, letter will wash all of that away. But not only for the city, but for our local developers that want to come in and build commercial, because it doesn't really affect the single family dwellings, but the multifamily stuff, um, anything commercial, if you get over 2,500 square feet of impervious, so pavement, concrete, roof, deck, any of that, the 2,500 is the golden number. And if you go over that, then the state mandated this MS4 upon us, all of that compliance, you know, all those permits, all those items come in. I, um, I know local developers around here can't shoulder that additional burden. And um, that's why we sent the waiver letter. And so the, I guess I should shut up and say, I got an email today saying we're getting a letter regarding it next week. I said, it's possible good news okay, when I sent it to the city manager this afternoon. I, I don't want to get excited about it yet because that's like a career win if I get it. Did they ever say why 2,500 square feet was the breaking point? Yeah, and 2,500, so anything under 2,500 was a small project. And there were, you still had to put in bioswales and stuff off your roof gutters, but right. it wasn't full blown hydro mod engineering reports right. that um, over the years, Fred down at Pace and I poured over this math and made sure everything worked. And um, on a lot of projects, it just didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. I mean, we all, on my side of the house, we all believe in the Clean Water Act. We live in Siskiyou, we all want clean water, um, but we, we there's just a lot more. So then from 2,500 to 5,000 jumped up to a whole nother slew of uh, costs for developers. and requirements for reporting on the city. So, I mean, we've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of staff hours just becoming compliant with this thing. And then over 5,000 goes bonkers, bonkers. Like 
Guarita Motors has massive stormwater detention basins buried under their their lot because of that permit. So I'm crossing my fingers that the letter we get hopefully next week is one step closer to that. We're not going to renew your next year's permit. Wow, that's good for development of any sort. Yeah, and it goes, like I say, the, the, the larger development, like truck stops and that kind of stuff, they're used to it if they're building in California, anywhere else. And so that doesn't really hurt the big, big developers, you know, but the, it's the local developers that it's really going to, really going to help. That's probably the number one complaint I get. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what do you mean I got to spend this money? Well, it's not us, it's the state. Right. The state said we had to have this MSJ. South Oregon Street's going to kick off um, next year. We've got the design firm cranking on it. They got the survey done. Uh, was that Cindy like three weeks ago? Three or four weeks ago, we met them out there. And they were finishing up survey. So they're working on that. We're talking with, I was just talking with um, the new CEO of Cisco Telephone. We're going to set a meeting with him because they want to put some stuff in the ground before we pave over it. Um, we, we, any kind of project like that, all of these paving projects, we contact all the utilities that we know are there. We contact all the utilities that we think might want to be there and get their designs drawn into our plans because it creates what we call a conflict. I talked a lot about conflicts on the, the main street job, but if the gas line is going to be their design and hit the water and that, so we, we get all the utilities together to make the spider web work and then we pave over it. And just be, yeah, so Cisco Telephone wants to get, they have a middle mile and last mile program where, the broadband. yeah, yep. So they want to throw in conduits for the future. So it doesn't mean that they're going to throw it all, all their fiber in now, but they get the conduits put in Didn't and marked out. Fiber down, like my neck of the woods, I thought yeah, there's fiber down. all over town, but yeah. it's fiber and everybody wants it and everybody wants it to the home. Like in Aetna, I'm, low, I'm lucky enough to have Cisco Tell base there. So I've got fiber to my home. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what the, the last mile stuff is, and get everybody hooked up. What's the I guess until Elon Musk start comes of it off. That? Of actually doing it. We don't have a start date yet because we're still in design. So in, until we get a little further, preliminary design and getting all that together right now. But I will brief you up as soon as we know. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. We got that. That's uh, step money that we pushed out. We pushed out a year on the construction side, and Jason and I were speaking to that this morning. I can only imagine if we would have slammed it through in front of another project, one of these other projects, and had South Oregon torn up right now with all the detours that we had on. That would have been a lot. So it worked out. I mean, pushing it off a year gave us the capacity dial in on the other projects and get these that I've already spoken to to where they are and then we'll slip in that South Oregon while Caltrans is doing their regional replacements because they're not tearing the whole thing out they're going to do it in sections from one section all the way down and all the way back up built so, oh, that's good. I've been so the detours on Main are going to be fairly light and and then I think I've mentioned before also that while we as the city hired our contractors to do the water and sewer portions we can detour to our surface streets. Caltrans cannot. It's in their code that they, if they have a highway available, they have to, and they have I-5 available. So the detours will be onto I-5, not onto Oregon Street. And then we'll be over on Oregon Street with one lane open as per plan. We're gonna have through traffic as often as possible on our project. And then Caltrans has to have North South traffic through there's also. So it's not going to be as messy as I explained it three years ago when this started, because the level of staging meetings that we've had with Caltrans and, and all that. So it's all going to come out in the wall. And they'll be out of here in 24. It's like right around the corner. And then if you've been out on the streets lately, you've seen the chip seal prep the crack ceiling that we got our internal guys at maintenance we're doing. Um, and then they started laying chip this week and we got pushed out a week, a day on the weather. Everything got bonkers. Ben turned more gray. Um, 
and he got it all roped back in and I, I just went out and drove greenhorn so upper and lower greenhorn got chipped we'll be coming back to fog that um the black tar that we shoot on the end and then stripe it with paint next week week after weather dependent if it rains it pushes us out everything has to be bone dry they prepped up Campbell. They prepped up sharps. Um, they chip sealed sharps. Yep. I drove it this morning, this afternoon. It yep. looks great. We had some hitches in our giddy up on that one too, because we've got a casino at the end of the road and yep. the county yards up there. And yeah, we got, we got in people's way uh -huh. and then we fixed it. Um, and now it's just got to come back and fog it. So that only takes an hour. I'll get the deep truck in there and spray I mean, the black stuff on it. The biggest part, the hardest one of that was the actually Wyaka trailer park. That was there the. Was big, big yeah, it was, yeah, it got ugly, but we uh -huh. have to get in somebody's way at some point to get things done. So yeah. we, and there were some, there were some issues and complaints, and we dealt with them the best we could. Oh yeah, I got some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. Um, and this is just phase one of this year's chip. They're going to come back in the fall and do a whole bunch of more. And I'll brief on that when we get closer to them. But that's the infrastructure. That is great. Thank you very much. And do you guys have any follow up questions for Mr. Bray? Is this too much information or is this good? No, that's great. Okay. This is awesome. Well, Thank you. awesome, man. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's why that's perfect. Like I said, we'll, at the end, we'll bring all those new yeah. what we brought up before. Yeah, perfect. Well, I, I thought it was interesting that we're talking about uh, disc, disc golf, but we've actually been talking about bocce ball. I mean, here at this west of Street uh, uh, Park for years, we've been talking about getting the bocce ball place over there, remember? And I think the disc golf is more driven by the public rather than yeah. If we had like a nonprofit bocce right. ball, because they're going to make the improvements, we're not paying. We're not paying right. The reason this is a yeah. project is because the the folks that are forming this nonprofit came to us with a plan. Yep. And we helped them tidy up that plan, ran it through planning to make sure it met CEQA and all that stuff. I don't do. Thank you, Juliana. Yeah. Um, but. So we've got a tidy package because they brought us a tidy package. Right. Uh, the bocce ball, yes, I've discussed it with probably three or four separate groups in the time right. I've been at the city. And the, um, and the but I've I've plan. never been brought an actual plan right. and, no. and a and formation of a nonprofit that's going to carry the maintenance and that kind of right. thing. And so. Yeah, and exactly. it might just be more public outreach to to explain to the public that's what it takes if you. If you have a want like bocce ball, I've been approached by pickleball folks, um, things of that nature. It really needs to be backed by a nonprofit. So you all can approve Jason to sign an MOU that diverts the maintenance back to the, the folks that, that built it, like the, the JMBA, Jefferson Mountain Bike Association with their pump track, same, same MOU as you're going to see at the next meeting with the, the disc golf. It's you take off. You take on all the maintenance and yep. the city will do you know exactly. trash cans and little stuff like that because it's still in the recreation area of the city exactly. um, but but i think that's yeah. a good point that uh john smith freeman has here is that um we would you know we'll discuss that more when we get to the end but um it's kind of leading towards a parks master plan and yeah. like a number of things because i know that council member mccoy would like to see some improvements at Greenhorn just on some current infrastructure that we have with the horseshoe pits. And so there's a number of things I think that this is why, you know, this is great. We do these exercises and then maybe we veer towards a larger analyzing our park system as a whole and what improvements we want to make. So long term yeah. plan, 10 year yep. plan. Yeah, absolutely. Plan. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. I appreciate Thank it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Matt. Matt. We're going to call our planning director up here. We do have a separate list of all the projects that aren't prioritized right now, and we do have Parks Master Plan on the inactive list. Um, so I don't know if this has been brought up yet, but hopefully it does. So these are the planning department special projects that we do in addition to our day to day. So we still do code enforcement, 
um, building and site plan review. Um, we currently have six site plan reviews for different businesses expanding or building. We've had nine code complaints today. Um, so this is in addition to that. So bear with me as we go through. Um, so the first one we have is our uh, Economic Development Administration Job Cluster Market and Feasibility Studies. This was a project um, that Jason is managing, um, but I've reviewed as well. Um, and it kind of fits into the planning community development like catch-all um, phrase. This it was uh, instigated by the SEDC and Steve before our arrival. And so right now we have a request for proposal out for a contractor to do an industry cluster analysis, which is basically going to provide a study of different industry areas that may be primed for growth and development within the city. So it focuses on larger areas. So I believe we included um, hospitality, restaurant, tourism. Uh, we included biotech. We included uh, uh, high-tech high uh, manufacturing uh, like that. So SCDC is managing most of that project, but we are also involved in that. There's also going to be a business incubator request for proposal going out as well. That's gonna be delayed so that we can get part of the industry cluster analysis done before we go to do that because we don't know what kind of businesses we're going to be incubating in that space. So we thought we'd kind of figure out what's gonna work for us as we go through and do that. So we're just providing support on that grant. Um, the next one is the housing element. As you're familiar with, uh, Plan West is our off uh, consultant who's going to be, work, who is working on that. Um, I'm also working on drafts for them as well. Um, we're hoping to have an initial draft ready for planning commission review in July at their regular meeting, July 20th. And then subsequently we'll be coming for first comments to the uh, council after that. So either the August 2nd or the second meeting in August. Um, the process for housing element updates is different from the general plan because it has to go to an initial review at the state and then it comes back to us for final approval. Um, and there will probably be some changes between then and now. So we are still moving forward with some of the other activities associated with the housing element, which is we are conducting more stakeholder interviews to now include large employers because one of the things we've been hearing is that um, employers cannot find enough housing for their employees. So we're going, getting more information on what that looks like, what kind of housing they're looking for um, to better be able to meet those needs. Workforce housing is a topic that will be within the goals of that element. So we are having a sector specifically for that. Um, there will also be a specific goal in there for the housing, um, sorry, homeless and unhoused populations, um, which kind of bleeds into some of the stuff that will be at the end of, of this session. Um, we're also going to be doing a citywide housing condition survey. Uh, we have not started that yet, but it's pretty uh, intensive. So we've developed a housing stock database looking at the uh, date that housing has been built and then what's the most recent building activity. And we're going to be focusing on some of those areas for redevelopment um, and looking at where we get code complaints most often because those houses uh, will most likely need the most work. Um, and may be eligible for abatement and redevelopment dollars through the community development block grant program. So the housing condition survey is basically we're on site going through the city and ranking each house based on a system that's approved by HCD on the condition of the housing. Um, the higher the number, the better. And the lower the number basically means it is not a livable uh, housing unit. So that will also give us additional information in that database to be able to target different areas with housing programs. So that is housing. We The next couple of items were put together through the Senate Bill 2 funding grant application, which closes in December. So these have taken precedent. You'll actually be hearing the safety element update and circulation update at your next meeting, June 21st. Um, this is an update to the safety and public health element with standard language that's required for us to get reimbursed through FEMA. And then the circulation update is to move from level of service, which measures congestion and the quality of road uh, metric to VMT, which is vehicle miles traveled, which is a new state mandate. So you'll hear more about that next week. And so those are directly funded through that grant. The next one is the comprehensive general plan update. Uh, we're a little bit of a hiatus. As I said before, we're very busy this summer uh, with code complaints and trying to keep up with certain things that haven't been done. We're also updating all of our applications. Uh, business license applications will be updated and all of our 
planning um, applications will be updated like conditional use permits. So that's kind of taken precedent while we get that done. We do have uh, bids in for our acoustic engineer who has to do the noise element measurements and assistance for that. And we have two finalists that we requested supplemental information from. So we've got that from them and we'll hopefully have a recommendation to council for awarding that contract in, in late July so that they can get started on that aspect of the general plan. Um, I also have been in contact with Caltrans and we are situated really well to be awarded a sustainable transportation planning grant, which would get us a more comprehensive transportation study that would update all of our data as well as work on different goals. That would include um, ADA compliance, pedestrian, cycling, what we call micro mobility, which is the electric bikes and scooters. Um, so we're, we're geared up to do that. We go for a grant for transportation because that data collection and analysis is, is very costly. And like acoustic engineering, it's a, it's a very specialized field that I do not have experience in. Most people do not um, for acoustics specifically. But so we're going to try and go for grants to be able to subsidize that data collection and get some really good transportation information to go into the plan itself. This is Council McCoy. As far as encouraging or we're looking at electric bikes and things. Um, my number one pet peeve is they're in cities, major cities, they're on sidewalks. Yep. They don't wear helmets. They don't con They don't uh, conform to the law. They run people over, they hit them, the deliveries, whether it's UPS, FedEx, or Grubhub or something like that. I mean, if we're gonna encourage that, are we gonna be able to have the ability to, um, are we gonna have the ability to make sure that, that we can manage some of those and ordinances negative. are followed. Yep. I mean, for instance, in your larger cities, you only have so many bikes at a station, electric mm -hmm. bikes, if you, if you have somebody that's coming in and putting them in there, whether it's city bike or whoever it is, mm -hmm. but I mean, even the private ones. So, um, how, what, how is that going to be addressed in this, you know, document? Yeah, so the circulation element is really unique for California that it doesn't just include transportation, it also includes utilities. And so there's a lot of overlap in the different topic areas that you're talking about with energy and technology. And so those factors will all be looked at within the circulation element. Um, you know, in terms of the e-commerce or the delivery updates, you know, we can definitely look at that as it becomes more and more of an issue. Um, but we do need some more data and we need to take a look at the streetscape specifically. Um, that's one of the other things I'd like to include within the planning grant is um, monies to do updated street design that's more unique and customized to the city of Wairika's needs, which would hopefully address whether we need temporary loading for delivery services, if we need um, specialized areas for those scooters to be placed. But there's a lot of literature around that that we can take a look at as that become, it becomes more of the forefront of being addressed. I think a biggie for uh, the thing I would be most concerned about is homeless people on sidewalks getting hit by them. And I would hope nobody would ride them on, but that's just not the case. Yep. I think 50, and when I go to, whether it's LA or San Diego or New York or whatever, it's 50% of them are on the sidewalks. Yeah, and which they should technically be in the street. They should be, yes. and the cops just say, well, we don't have the time. Yeah. We don't have the time to mm -hmm. do this. So then they hit people and they, you know, hurt them pretty bad sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's all part of that planning yeah, process. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a concern for me because I am not a huge supporter of, you know, bicycle, I can turn around with my hand and go bam and, and, and hit somebody and knock them down when they get ready to hit me. But those are, these other ones are a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And they weigh an extra, you know, the batteries are stuff and weigh an extra 100, 125 pounds. So. Yeah, and there, there are different other facets that we can take a look into. So there's the American League of Cyclists, which actually has a whole uh, system of becoming what we call a bike friendly city. And one of the things that they address is how are you dealing with, um, they've renamed it now, it's not enforcement anymore, but it is about how are we doing education for the people who are riding, as well as how are we educating our law enforcement who will be enforcing the rules, because a lot of times we find with the police department that they don't have as much training on how to deal with some of these other modes of transportation, as opposed to vehicle transportation. So it's, it's a multi-pronged process, and we, we do have to have integrated department buy-in on that. And we will address that as a holistic okay. type of approach. Yeah, because in larger cities, that has nothing to do with training. It has to do with, we don't have the time. Mm -hmm. We're not going to write a ticket. I mean, yep. they're going, last time I was in, in, in Brooklyn, Manhattan, they're going the wrong way through traffic. 
yeah. on a on a on a five lane boulevard. Yeah, and the and technology the, and the has cops, yeah. the cops look at them and I said, "Are you going? No, I'm not going to touch it." The messenger bikes are really good. Well, the UPS bikes, messenger bikes. Yeah. I've got electric bikes, and they pull trailers behind. Really? Yep. Oh yeah, and they've got uh, those yellow and black tubs you buy at Walmart. They got eight of those stacked up. Sometimes they have two trailers behind. Them. Wow. That's how UPS and FedEx deliver everything in the city. So. Well, the nice thing is, is the adoption of technology for rural communities is slower than urban centers. So we have a little bit of buffer time to address some of those issues more thoroughly. So that's the next part. Hopefully that's not going to happen Thank during you. our lifetime. Well, yeah. <laughs> typically it's a seven year lead time for any technology change to be introduced. So we do have like Grubhub now. This is why reset it might take right. a little longer. Well, Maybe. I, my son has an electric bike and it's not 125 pounds heavier. It's just, it's got this little like 20 pound part on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it does go faster, though. You're right. Well, and they're required in California to wear a helmet, and they don't. Oh, my son does. That's a requirement. A, a, a motorcycle, a DOT motorcycle helmet. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next one's not as interesting. Uh, we are working on a new department man uh, records management update. Um, just looking at different ways of how we can digitize and keep everything more professionally managed for a system citywide. Um, this is just going to make it easier for public records requests. It'll make it easier for people who want to look up more information about their property files. We get a lot of that and we spend a lot of time working with people throughout the week to get that information. Um, and that'll bleed into another item that's at the end of planning community development. Uh, the next one is objective design standards, which is part of the Senate Bill 2 grant that was approved in 2020. Uh, this item develops uh, standardized objective design standards for multifamily housing of five units or more. Planning Commission did visit the item last night at their Planning Commission meeting and requested some additional information. So we'll, we're working on that, on that with them, and that'll be brought to City Council at some point. Um, it, it allows for a ministerial and streamlined process for those um, if they follow certain criteria. The next one is telecommunications ordinances. Uh, we are in the process of taking a look at the different ordinances throughout the city. The telecommunications has expanded a little bit to also including uh, power and energy a little bit. So we're looking at undergrounding ordinance updates um, to make sure that that's done consistently throughout the city for new development, as well as looking at different opportunities for undergrounding current power lines and wires. Uh, we are also having ongoing meetings with the Karuk, the county, um, and Jason's involved with those as well to determine future direction on broadband services and just kind of keep a finger on the pulse for that one. Uh, the next one is child care ordinance. There was a very major shift in daycares in California that happened at the beginning of this year. So I'm working with Felicia on updating all of our ordinances and license processes around uh, child care services. Uh, we're also doing just municipal code updates as they happen. As you've seen from previous meeting, we had four, which is the next item, which is basically done. We're just waiting for that to ratify on July 7th and it'll get off the list. We've probably gotten to about 27 different ordinances need to be updated just based off of old mandates. Some of them are not legal anymore. Some of them don't pertain to anything. Like for example, it is illegal to wear high heels on the tennis court. Um, and you can get a $25 fine or spend up to two days in jail for that, which is not a thing anymore. Uh, this also, yeah, this also includes our business licensing um, ordinances as well. We'll hopefully be updated to be a little bit more current. Um, some of the professions that we have listed in our muni code are fascinating. Um, I believe the business license ordinance was done in 25. 1925 wow. so maybe need to update that a little bit uh so yeah it, it, it there's there's quite a bit of work to be done and then there's a couple of other mandated pieces that um we have to do for the municipal code um so planning ordinances cp variance rezoning you know about that one that one's going to close out here pretty soon uh, the Wairika Swim Center in Native Park, uh, Jason can talk about this more, but just the brief update is I believe that the city attorney is drafting the tax measure language and we will hopefully have that on for the 21st meeting. That is correct. That is our goal at this time is to have that on Tuesday and uh, it is a mad dash this week. And so, and then other than that, you are aware of the um, closed session negotiations that we're currently doing, so. And then the only other item to add is that we are drafting the request for proposal for design build for the pool and park. Um, we have not 
um, done anything with the sequa piece yet. So that's, that's the other one that needs to start getting addressed at some point as we move through the process. Uh, the next one is the Corpyard Greenhorn Park fencing and gate project. Uh, Cindy is managing this one. We're just, we're basically putting in some new gates there. Um, I think she's left for the day. So if you want to ask her about that later, it's a very minor project, but still needed to go out to bid, still needs someone to manage it. Um, and that's being uh, funded through enterprise funds. The next one is the Recreation Economy for Rural Communities, RERC technical assistance that's funded through the EPA, US Forest Service and Northern Border Regional Commission. This does not, we have no allocations in the general fund for this at this point. Um, it's mainly just been Jason or myself attending the meetings. Um, this is being primarily managed by SEDC, and I believe there's going to be a workshop next week. Yes, that is correct. So, and I'll send out more information. I know Ms. Smith Freeman will be there, but there'll be some workshops to attend. So. Uh, the next one is the Carnegie Building, which is a collaborative project between the city and SCDC. Uh, this is being funded through USDA funds and uh, community development block grant funds. Uh, right now, they are currently working on the uh, engineering design for the updates of the building and to address the asbestos and other items in that building. Um, this is also partnered with our Brownfield grant project. And then uh, right now we have just mainly been having meetings with how to accommodate ADA compliance on the building. And then uh, CEQA NEPA needs to be done for this. Uh, SEDC has a consultant doing that instead of us, which is lovely because we do not have time, uh, but we are still coordinating with them on that, that document preparation since we are technically, we could be the lead agency for that. Uh, the next one is the community theater HVAC. Uh, Cindy is also managing this project, but mainly uh, we have the office, the Ogles grant. Please don't ask me what that acronym is. That's probably one of the few I don't know off the top of my head. Um, that is the per capita funding through the Prop 68 fund through parks. And so uh, we have been trying to get an upgraded HVAC system for the community theater. The first round of bids uh, was not successful. The second round of bids was less, less successful. So Cindy is having to go and get direct quotes from vendors to do this project. Um, it's just really busy. Everybody's really booked out right now for projects. So we're just kind of working on trying to get that done. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, like I said, it's just it's finding the right people to be able to do the job. The first round of bids that we got, the individuals weren't even bidding the correct project or even getting us what we needed to get through that. And then the second round of bids, we received none um, because we did give them a chance to correct their bid. And then they decided to not take the job just due to workload. And now legally, we are allowed to just go get a quote and get somebody to do the work. Yeah, we were real happy with the guy who did the uh, Wainema Hall project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so Cindy is working on that and we're going as quickly as we can, but yeah, everybody's very, very busy. So we've got the City Hall remodel project, which we're hoping to fund through CDBG program income. Uh, the RFP is actually out today. Cindy got that done. Uh, so we will hopefully get someone to help us with the uh, design and engineering for that. Um, we're hoping to look at ADA compliance and close breezeway between this building and that building um, and do some upgrade construction for both these buildings. You can actually go to the bathroom yeah. without having to unlock the front doors if we're in this room. I know. Yeah. So that RFP is out. Uh, that should close in 30 days. So the theater roofing project, uh, this is Matt, but Matt has uh, met on the grant. Um, some costs are not covered by the grant in the current budget and we're just still working on trying to get that done. So, uh, senior bus has been purchased. So it is purchased, it is coming. We are waiting for final parts, I believe is where we're at. Yes, we've got a chassis. Um, <laughs> So the senior bus has been purchased. And then finally, for planning on here, uh, we have a public GIS interface, which is also part of the LEAP funding um, local early action program. Uh, and the Senate Bill 2 funding, uh, Kevin Jorgenstone, who works in the Public Works Department as our GIS specialist, has completed digitizing a lot of our files. So what we're doing is we're developing a web-based portal of all of our mapping so that members of the public and developers, whomever, can use that information. Um, you can click on a parcel, you can pull up where, you know, the Wairika Creek is, 
um, different things like that. Um, that is part of this and needs to be done by December. Um, right now we're working on some additional layers. Uh, we really didn't have any online mapping for any of our planning stuff. So we're basically having to go through and build all of those layers in that database. Uh, so that will hopefully be launching later this year. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Good question. Did you notify Madrone that the house that the house has been that the bus has been ordered? The chassis. Chassis. Okay. Oh, they have been. They've had to sign some documentation. So. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Cool. Thank you. With, I, with that bus, do you know are we meeting is federal legislation? I know the post office is in trouble because they just bought a bunch of gas vehicles. Um, and I know that uh, the federal government is, has to be all all electric by 35. Do we know what, what they're going to do to us as a, or what the current governor might do to us as a municipality? Have we had any inkling of when, you know, we're going to have to have electric fire engines like Canada does and stuff like that? We do definitely know that that is coming. And right now, I think the perspective when I was involved with stage is that we're waiting on the technology to increase south and north of us to pretty much mimic what other larger agencies are doing while they drive down the cost of those larger pieces of equipment, such as the buses or you know fire engines and uh -huh. heavy equipment. So right now we are still within a cycle of the age of one of these vehicles. It's appropriate that we continue to buy either diesel or regular gas vehicles at this time, but definitely that with the planner here. <laughs> Uh, as we move forward, there should be, we should be seeking to work with the LTC and getting some planning money wherever available to reevaluate the whole, the system as a whole, because obviously we would need charging stations as well. And so being such a small agency, it's just prudent to wait. And so the price comes down as the scale gets larger. But as, but, but as far as, I'm sorry, okay. but as far, um, Mr. City Manager, as the as the uh, legislation goes in California, we don't have anything hard and fast yet, is my understanding, like they do at the federal level where, they're, where they are going to all electric by 2035. I believe that the governor did come out within the last two years and make some statements that I think maybe correlate with 2035. It's the, it would discontinue the sale of diesel and gasoline vehicles, but I don't believe it extends to utilities in certain aspects. I do know right now there's current regulation with the California Air Resource Board, which is typically the enforcement arm mm -hmm. of this type of stuff. Um, we do get a lot of lead time on these vehicles, and they're only just starting now to get into some of the like 35-year-old vehicles and discontinuing them for trash haulers and cities. So we are usually given a lot of lead time uh, before we are able to go into that. So what most likely will happen is we may not be able to purchase any more uh, diesel or gasoline vehicles at 2035, but we will still be able to maintain the ones that we have. Okay, see the, the feds have said you, they will not maintain them. They will, mm -hmm. they gotta be done. So my concern is spending a lot of money on something that's gonna turn over and have to be electric. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I agree with you on the um, technology, but uh, by 2035, the technology is not gonna be here on how to expand, keep a battery from dying on you in the winter in Siskiyou County as opposed to Reading because they do die and they do take up up to 40% less power, less mileage in Siskiyou County than they would say in Bakersfield or LA where it's warmer. So, you know, that's, that's, and, and then again, there's no market for a used electric vehicle. There's, there's no market because the batteries are too expensive. So that's my concern is that we're just getting, you know, that we don't get in too deep. Uh, I'm not advocating for or against that we don't get too deep in vehicles when we know that at some point, we're going to change it. Well, you raise a great point because ultimately that's kind of the, this process is so in the back of your head already, and I know in the back of our head is a planning document to transition that I would see quite honestly, in my opinion, and I'll uh, kind of would curious of your input, Juliana, but probably at least two to three years out before we would seek that planning document. And, and just for um, our information, uh, you know, whatever it looks like, the local transportation commission working with uh, the county stage has not even begun to purchase electric vehicles for the state for the transportation system. Hasn't even begun. And so 2035 is just a cool. 
Yeah, it's, so it's coming around. It's coming around. The other ways that you're right, you know, visionary, we need yeah. to start looking at that. It, but luckily, we don't have as big a fleet as the county does. Yeah. They're yeah. the ones that really need to start looking at it. But when you're purchasing things like fire engines, I look at the ones they're purchasing in Canada and having for the last two years. They're quite expensive to get an electric fire engine. Mm -hmm. Now, they're allowed to keep one in, internal uh, combustion engine for real emergencies and then they also bring along generators to charge up the uh the fire the fire uh trucks but um which i, I i'm not even going to get into that yeah but yeah. i just yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense yeah. you gotta, gas, you gotta generator, get a gas generator gas to generator. power up an electric vehicle that makes a lot i mean we've been waiting for 30 years to get <laughs> phone chargers that are the same and yeah. how long is it going to take them to give us car chargers that are the same yeah, but you think true. about it, the technology is changing rapidly. And yeah. the cell phone, look at the, the bat, you know, the life of a cell phone now and how long you can get mm -hmm. and what it does in conjunction. And I heard they've come up, actually, I heard just recently, they actually did come up with a new battery um, that's getting developed right now that's supposed to be the, the last one. We so, dispose 80 million of these annually in the world. 80 million, not, not recycled. We dispose 80 million in landfills. Yeah. Well, before we go, uh, I'm yeah. sorry to cut you guys off, but uh, before we go too far off, just if we have any more questions for uh, the planning director. And the only other item I was going to hit is there is a hazard mitigation and emergency response strategic goal where we're looking at updating all of our safety based ordinances. I believe this was a request from the city manager to review the ordinances and also develop language on temporary uses versus specific situations. For sheltering, sheltering animals during natural disasters. I think that came up a little while ago. So that is also on the docket. It's under hazard mitigation, but we're also handling that as well. So. Great. Excellent. I've, Thank I've you very much. Questions. Okay. Uh, Councilman Smith Freeman brought this up. Um, we are way, way behind on the community theater HVAC. I mean, way behind. This, this should have been in the bag probably mm -hmm. in March, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, March, April, or May. It was supposed to be done um, last year. It was supposed to be done about four years ago. Well, actually, supposed to, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but I mean, this council finally got pushed. Up. Any, how can we push this up? I mean, this really needs to be like pushed up to tomorrow. At this really point, does. we legally had to go through the process of the RFP, and so we went through that process twice, and now we are capable of technically just seeking a quote and contracting and so that that's what we're going to do so and do we have uh i don't want i don't need names we have uh, a company or two in mind that we're going to contact and when are we going to contact them? we have a local company here that we believe is capable it's not a norm from my understanding it's not a normal hvac no. project it requires pace on uh the back end or the front end of this project so uh, I will convey that information to Cindy, who's managing that, and we'll get a timeline. And then within the staff report on Tuesday, I'll follow up with the timeline. Thank you. Yeah, I, I personally like it fast track. And I had to wait four and a half months to get mine uh, for just a, um, from a local company here. They had to wait four and a half months um, because of the lack of them. So I don't know, maybe all, maybe the ones in the, that they're going to put in there is going to be more readily available, but I'd like to have a timeline as to when they order it you know, when they order it, when it's going to be here mm -hmm. first, because then after that, they've got to figure out how to pitch in. Yeah, exactly. I think that what we're seeing is there was an, an influx of ARPA and COVID funding that schools and businesses were redoing their HVAC systems for MERV, whatever compliance. And so all of these people, there's an influx of money as we kind of approach maybe a downturn economically. There's also the stimulus money that are keeping contractors extremely busy. And then obviously the supply chain issue is uh, wreaking havoc on this particular project. And it was wreaking havoc for a little while on this on the sewer and water project. Um, but we will bring you that information on Tuesday. Yeah, it's not your guys' issue. It's one, it's, we've been through three city managers and department heads, and it's just, it seems to get dropped all the time. And it's yeah, well, especially yeah. Well, we didn't have the funding. That's what's nice about it now. We have the funding. Yeah. Before, right. when we started this process, we didn't have the funding. No. Right. So that's what's cool about it. We actually do now. Um, can I ask another question on the Carnegie Building? It's see, how, how long is our? What's that? Wait, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. 
But Retta held up her hand and I'm- I was just gonna say this was the third bid really because after the first bid on this call, the um, we had to go back to paste engineering because the design specs after the walkthrough with the contractors were not adequate. Oh, so that's uh, right. this is actually, we had to update design specs. So this is actually yep. the, um, so it went through the paste engineering design process. Then it went out to bid for the second time with the updated design specs in February. Then it went out again in a April, I believe. So why do we need PACE to review them again? The first bid, it was inadequate. That was, um, I believe, during COVID, um, and it was also. So we get a discount the next time? <laughs> so we paid them for something that wasn't was adequate? No, no I believe count. that what happened was, is everybody felt that this was kind of like an HVAC system at your house. And so when the contractor came in, the realization was, is that for whatever reason, it's a very technical system well, and, and PACE had to engage the to- The first one, we had not engaged yeah. PACE. And that's, so this is actually the third time, but um, the first bid with the corrected specs, nobody um, responded to. And then the second bid with the corrected specs, nobody responded to. Considering how stringent the requirements are to work with the state, we did not have that those issues, same issues on the fairgrounds. So that kind of yeah, surprises except for me. size, talk totally different size. That's a huge. Wainema Hall is huge. They had to get a uh, commercial right. uh, I'm unit in there. This, the it's community not theater is way larger as far as air mass to move than, than Wainema would ever think about. You, yes, got tall. A, you got a tall ceiling. 40 foot ceiling. Yeah, probably. you got way different air handling capabilities that has to be presented on something like that. Okay. That's, it is a totally different circumstances. You got a, you know, a, a 10 foot, 9 foot ceiling at uh, Wainema Hall versus a ceiling. Way tall. Oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah, took tall. the ceiling 30, 30 out, so there. now it's got the peak. Yeah, no, I know, but it's still you masses, air mass differences. It could also be the age of the system itself. Again, when you have some of these older systems and you go to update them, they don't necessarily like to mesh well. And so some of it has to be customized and custom made. So that might be another issue that we're running into. It is not, not being a typical system, even if it is commercial, um, it may have some specialized pieces. But we are definitely hearing the interest to get this one uh, <laughs> yeah. over the finish line. And so um, we will communicate that with staff tomorrow and then get you the updates um, because all we need now legally is a quote in a contract. One thing I can say is this is, is one, one, one good thing about the delay, even though we hate delays, we actually came beneficial in this circumstance is because we, we actually got funding. we got funding to right. fund it where yeah. if we would have jumped Thanks in it, but i don't i don't agree with delays yes. either but it's, it was well, a good it was one that came well, out it has nothing benefit. to do with that Rada found the funding mm -hmm. that was Thank really you, good and remember matt had that um what was that outside generator oh yeah, yeah it's thing. still there it's an emergency still there yeah. well it was an emergency thing that lasted three years <laughs> so and paul had another question yeah, um, do you, again, this doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, this was long before you guys were here or even our interim, but I haven't seen a document on the uh, Carnegie building. Uh, we were getting regular updates and, and we were looking at the, the terms and everything. And we haven't seen anything like that probably 10, 11 months. Will that be forthcoming uh, before anything is signed on the dotted line? Absolutely. The, okay. We are currently going through the Surplus Lands Act at the moment, and I believe we're somewhere in the mid 40 day range or upper 40 day range. And the attorney for EDC and our city attorney are connected in discussing an agreement and you will have we'll have plenty of conversation about this topic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then finally, on planning and community development general plan uh, uh, 2044, yeah, uh, you have an RF, uh, acoustic RFP and you're processing four bids. Um, and again, I'm, I'm assuming from what you said, that's looking at noise, mm -hmm. correct? Um, what about lighting, outside lighting? Because I've had complaints from uh, two tourists and a local based on business lighting in this town and pulling up and going, well, this, you know, one guy, uh, gained that he was uh, a light. That's what he did for a living, and he, and he probably did. 
But um, are we also looking at that? That would, and... yep, that would be in the conservation element. And okay. so there's a very large nexus between lighting and biological resources. It does interrupt a lot of species. Um, Wairika is a fairly bright city. Um, you have car lots, um, that's kind of usually an issue. Uh, yeah. Truck stops and car lots um, are usually very, very bright. Uh, one of the things we do have is the updated building code does require uh, dark sky compliant lighting, which is something that we can look into adopting as a city ordinance um, and work on those processes uh, to do that. We are actually working on a couple of code complaints related to lighting not meeting those specs. Um, we also do have uh, current regulations in the zoning code that requires all of our lighting to be downward facing and to not uh, pollute adjacent properties. So if we do have a situation like that within the city, you can fill out a code complaint um, and we encourage people to do that. So we keep a paper trail um, and we're slowly working on getting to those okay. cases. Thank you. So, I appreciate yeah. your time. Yep. Any questions? I'm Thank done. Perfect. Good you were ready to run, I saw Thank that. Thank you very much, Juliana. <laughs> yeah. You've got a long drive. Thanks, Juliana. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to go ahead and cover, um, and maybe with some help of anyone else that wants to chime in, but just real quickly getting through the rest of these. So uh, the emergency generator project, that grant was awarded and was being managed by someone that's no longer employed here. And so I will have to follow up with Matt, but essentially that he, he recently kind of reevaluated that, gathered the information from where we were in that project. And essentially, these were the tow along generators that we were getting, and they would run the emergency um, well system uh, when needed. We also obviously are working, we're being pretty proactive with Chief Lemos, the assistant city manager, and Cindy and Public Works. We are working with the consultant regularly. I think we've had two meetings in the last six weeks. Uh, with Ashby to discuss uh, the new fire hall and the planning document. We still are just in hiatus with getting the official letter uh, for that grant to be, uh, so we can start moving actively on that. But there are some things we're lining out proactively. So once that letter comes, we'll be able to move forward. So, and I believe Juliana touched on the hazard mitigation and emergency response um, safety ordinance update that she's working on. We also generally, we manage a portion of the Brownfield DPA grant as a subrecipient over to the EDC. So when we look at a site for contamination or for development, we generally get with the EDC and then we'll do analysis, what they call a phase one and phase two, which we've done on a number of sites within the city of Wairika. That, that is really just a very much an ongoing asset that we use. Uh, and currently the assistant city manager is really heading up uh, with Chief Lemos and Chief Gilman and Josh Stanshaw, I believe, is a part of that team, Retta. Uh, and we actually had all department heads on a meeting recently where we're looking at rectifying some of the dispatching issues, the medical dispatching for the fire department. So that is an ongoing project that we've just started discussion on. We also have a total compensation study that our HR director, and I apologize, our HR director is unable to make it tonight. So he is under the weather. So I have asked him to stay home. But um, the total compensation study that is actively being worked on at the moment as we go into, we will have that document ready for negotiations with the different uh, unions. Uh, John Elsnab. Renee, Retta, and myself, but really headed up by John with LCW Consulting, is working on the update to the personnel policy, and that's going rather well. We are definitely upgrading and beefing up our personnel policy. The goal is to have that ready as a negotiation with bargaining as well. And then, did you want to talk, Emily, at all about the citywide fee schedule and possibly the 218 and where we stand on that. Sure. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're currently prepping with PACE uh, to start working on our next 218 process, which is where we evaluate our systems and we evaluate our rates for our utilities. Uh, that should start in this coming fall. Uh, should be have rates implemented sometime January 2024. I look at her to make sure I have the right date in mind. <laughs> Uh, and we're lo looking at our overall fee schedules for all of our activities. You heard Juliana mention that our business ordinances are from 1925. Uh, so we will be doing a full evaluation and establishing where those are at. Good. I Perfect. Think that's valuable just because to keep an, an update, to keep it up to snuff to where then we don't get caught in the future by our fees being way too yeah, low and then have to yeah. make a big adjustment to adjust for that. That's Absolutely. What's with our water, you know, with, yes. in the past, that's, we got tons of complaints on that because we weren't raising that level gradually and we did it all at once and then everybody complained. So yeah. it's and valuable to do that in increments to make sure everybody's not getting jabbed at once. Exactly. And we need to be making sure that we're covering our costs mm -hmm. of providing services, yes. which is the goal. Absolutely not. No, we're no, right no. now. We're, we're we're supplementing more yes, than yes, making. Yes, <laughs> definitely not making a profit. <laughs> I was just talking to somebody from Montague, and that's been their yeah, biggest so problem is they haven't raised so anything, and they're so far behind that now they don't know how they're going to catch up because they're they've gotten so far behind. So, yeah. yeah, it's huge. Keep up on top of it. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you very much, Emily. And so I'm going to um, circle back because we only have three left, but I'm going to go to the last two. And so uh, part of the general plan, there's a, I believe they call it a homeless action plan, but here it still says a homeless housing program. And uh, we are talking to the county and as they go through and update their HAP, we will be a part of that uh, process and we'll be able to utilize that document. And then I think I, we spoke at nauseum when I first started over the PLHA grant, the public local housing allocation grant. And that is now open, I believe, and closing again in December. We have actively worked Emily, Josh, myself with Madeline Bryan and Dr. Sarah Collard at the county, incorporated Sarah Springfield from YES. And we have worked out a plan where we will take on, basically, uh, we will organize the other cities sending the funding to the county. We will also send our funding to the county and they will use that funding for sheltering and they have other money set aside specifically for youth. So you will see all of that information coming forward over the next couple months, at least with our share. Right, and they get funding from the state. The county does a lot more than we get. Absolutely. And part of this, um, it's ongoing. I believe it is the only source of ongoing funding. And so it is the most appropriate source that it would be used for long term agreements for um, an operator for sheltering. So, so it's, that's a lot of good things. Thank you so much for taking a bull by the horns and getting that worked with the, with the county because that are the ones that really needs to step up and. and and good. a huge thank you to our supervisor that represents us. Nancy's been working with Jason on that. Too. Thank you, Nancy. And so it's been good. Yeah, thank you for doing that. And it's, uh, it's going to be a joint effort, which is going to really make a big difference on everybody. And you know, Jason and I just had this discussion today about this and moving forward on how that looks, too, because there's a lot of the other cities that are going to be involved in this. And so they're doing out some uh, outreach to all these cities that are eligible. That's the key thing we need to make sure that they are eligible for this. Their housing, their housing element needs to be up to stuff or else they're not eligible. So there might be a few cities that aren't going to be part of this program, but I think a biggest majority of them will be part of this program. The main ones that hit will be uh, Shasta, Reed, and some of those, you know, some other cities. But those are ones I think they see a value in it because they're also the ones that hit with homeless problems too. So they're going to see a big value in this moving forward. Absolutely. And if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to come back to this one yes, issue. Yeah, and I know sorry. I have some folks in the crowd that want to talk about 
um, the urban campground. And so we'll save that until we'll go back to the slideshow real quick, because I just want to show you as we lead into next year, next calendar year, and we come back to start doing strategic planning over hopefully for the next three plus years, how I would like to move forward. So basically by looking at this project list and working backwards, we've identified five different goals. And that would be the activity that I would shoot for in our first meeting at say early January is we would just game plan the multitude of goals. We would start with as many as you wanted and then whittle them down and projects would fall underneath. Currently, they fall underneath these five goals and it's really irrelevant. We have the projects, we have to work the list. So we're gonna work the list. I'm just showing you what a strategic plan would technically look like at the moment. The first goal I really wanted to, call water but looking at all of the projects with infrastructure we just stuck with infrastructure you can see the correlation on the left hand side the strategic goal then we have unhoused homelessness programming hazard mitigation and emergency response fiscal resiliency and planning and community development and so when i look around the state or the western states and i think personally if it were just me doing what i wanted to do I would look at four personal goals that are water, fire safety, homelessness, and housing. And the cities that really focus on that, I think will be set up for the next 10 to 20 years. But th those will be determinations made by the council and then the projects will flow off of that. So if we can go to the next slide. So as you can see here, if we were to sit on January and you guys said, and I would like them to be a little bit more specific than infrastructure. Maybe we would have infrastructure and water. We would have uh, infrastructure and, and maybe different spe specificities under infrastructure, but you can see how many projects, and these are majority are public works projects that we currently have on the docket right now. And most of these, as you heard tonight, are all very active. The planning piece, and I believe Juliana and Retta don't know exactly, but it's usually a dollar in planning saves eight dollars. Is that right? Seven to eight dollars in construction. So a lot of these projects went through a serious amount of planning before they actually the public started to see them. So the other strategic goal, as I see it right now, is around planning and community development. And obviously, our planner is extremely busy and has her hands on a number of projects currently. And the general plan is also a very large lift that includes the general plan kind of includes a multitude of these projects as well, all wrapping into the general plan. The housing element was kind of a part of the general plan. Uh, next slide, please. So then we have hazard mitigation, emergency response. So for me, this is where fire would go. So we have the generator project and the fire hall and then fiscal resiliency. Really, I remember a couple months ago talking to some members of the staff and I said, you know, 22, 23 this is a year of revenue. Go give, me some, go give me some money so we can do some of these fun projects. So uh, that's what uh, Emily, our finance director, was just referencing. So we have the 218 and then a complete evaluation of where we stand on different revenue measures and projects that we can implement um, to make sure that we're charging appropriately for what we're actually giving and not subsidizing uh, some of the projects or programs that we currently run. And then the last slide, is there another one? So then unhoused and homelessness. Um, Obviously, we're about to talk about the urban campground. We do have, and I'll just kind of briefly say, DTSC did get back to Juliana this week. They will pay for the cleanup at the uh, urban grant campground site on Foothill. And so part of tonight is they, but they also want to know what the um, development looks like after the cleanup takes place. So that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. And obviously, we worked out PLHA. Uh, next slide, please. So we made it through. Originally, I thought we would come back in August, but what make if we didn't finish, but what makes the most sense to me is after the election, 
uh, pretty much in early January, we would come back and reassess actual strategic planning. We can bring the project list back and do more of, more of this type of uh, update whenever you want in between that time. But I think it probably makes the most sense to get through that election. And then we would lead into the next budget. And you guys really in that first session or session two, knowing what we're looking for our goals, we would just start writing down all the different types of goals from a 20,000 foot view of the council. What improvements do you wanna see? Where do you wanna see us focus? And then we would take that information after a few workshops and we would come back to you with a large project list knowing where funding was available. Maybe we wouldn't have all the projects that you desired, you can redirect us. And then we could whittle that down and build out the next three years so that we we're just all moving in the same direction. So if that works for the council, I propose that we come back in early January for that strategic planning session. We can do that here, but I have heard from some council members that maybe another location is something they wanna consider. So please reach out and let me know if that time frame works. And ultimately too, as we heard tonight, the HVAC obviously is a very high priority. And so we can have a multitude of just going over the project list meetings from here until uh, the end of the calendar year. It's really up to you guys how often you want us to revisit this. So. I think it'd be nice to just kind of go over it one more time before the year, before the, the, whoever ends up on city council at the next election, just, just to go over it, whether it be August, September, whatever, I, I would say closer to that point in time, just so it's fresh on the people that are definitely remaining, or I should say definitely remaining, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're signed up for another couple more years, Corey and I are, so. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I think it'd be good for us as a council. I don't know about you, Corey, but I think it'd be nice for us as, a, as the two for sure that are remaining that uh, to go over one more time before uh, whoever steps on for council. If, yeah, if it makes sense to the first, we could wait for the new council to seat and we could do the same exercise leading in more to goals because tonight we're leading into kind of a broad discussion about urban campground. It looks like we'll be able to kind of get through this list if that makes more sense. So that then if we do end up with different council members, um, they're just up to date on what we currently have in right. the docket. I think it's just a matter of going over the list one more time um, before a new council comes up over. So some of these might be off the list, right? Yeah, well, exactly. and that's what I wanted to talk about. So. So we, we know what's on the list. Mm -hmm. And uh, Juliana told us that some of the things that I talked about are off the list, that it didn't come back to us to get off the list. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to talk about is the things that, that we feel are important. Like I, I understand you say that we're at capacity, that we still have some need. And yeah, and uh, said, you know, the ones that we've had heard from a lot. I mean, we packed this place over tennis courts. It was packed. There wasn't a seat in the house and when we did the tennis courts. So tennis courts, the dog pound, we've been talking about, you know, the dog shelter. Well, Paul and I, Paul's the one who pushed it over the line. He made the touchdown to get any improvement in that facility. And actually, we haven't had a report on it. Yeah. And I don't know how long. Well, you and I looked yeah. at it, and the improvement that we asked for as a council is Wasn't not the improvement that was made. Uh, we were very, very clear on that, too. Well, we yeah. went down before it was finished. We were very clear on that city manager. So, no, so I have. Hi, sorry. Um, regarding the dog pound, our facility, the shelter, we have been working with Bray Booten and in contact with the rescue ranch uh, as recently as last week. We had reached out to them in somehow partnering with them and how we can uh, facilitate a uh, MOU agreement with them of having them house our dogs and how that would look as far as upgrading their facilities, et cetera, since they are well equipped to handle dogs. And so we're just working out some of those details with them of what they need and what would work best for the city as well. I think we... Yes, in fact, I went and spoke with them. Spoke with. They weren't interested at the time. At the time. Currently, they're considering. 
actually it was our side that had an issue with it right. and it was because they um, regarding the timing for picking them up or dropping them off because they don't have an attendant there 24 7 right. so the police officer wouldn't have keys to get into their facility to leave a dog kind of thing so it was logistics like that that took it off the table so we're um opening up that conversation with them again to yeah. see if we can somehow come to a mutual agreement between right. the two of us. I think we brought that up at one of the last finance committee meetings. Yeah, I think we talked yeah. about it a little bit. And yeah. my, my only uh, uh, addition to that, and I, I mentioned, I think at the meeting would be to see that our animals, we don't usually have a lot. I mean, if we have three, that's a lot, but that our animals are housed in some kind of a- Indoor. Uh, permanent shelter, not one of the outdoor shelters. Right. That would be number one for, for me. Just, you know. We will keep that in mind as yeah. we What's that? we'll keep that in mind as we get into negotiations yeah, I mean, further. Yeah. yeah. If we have Absolutely. to build something, then we'll build it out there or something. I don't We've know. been talking about it and you know we really like that place where channel four was, and then right behind it is that area where they used for dog <clears> training <throat> that could very well be yeah, my only thing is having had that building for Channel 4 on my campus, yeah. I wouldn't put my dog in there. No, no, that, that would be outside. Okay, I wouldn't, use the, I wouldn't use the building for, you know, I had it on my okay, campus over here for yeah, three years. years. Yeah, that's the good dog park, the tennis Pretty sports, old and decrepit. the basketball, <laughs> the, uh, and I don't want us to lose sight of the park host. We need to keep the park program, and I did hear uh, Juliana talk about the uh, overall general yeah i think we would seek a planning grant and we would then start with the parks master plan and do an evaluation because ultimately the same similar funding mechanism or say prop 68 i know grace bennett is doing a lot of improvements at hibbard field with prop 68 funding and I think that is, we would first and foremost itemize everything that needed to be improved. We would get feedback from the community on where they wanted to focus those improvements. Uh, and then we would seek funding through Prop 68 more than likely to make that tennis court improvement. Cause I know um, it's substantially more than people generally in the public understand. I think it was like a quarter million, $300,000 to make those improvements. So. Um, and ultimately, you know, we would also gauge the public at that time through the master plan process to see if that was still a priority as a tennis, you know, I, I'm not a tennis player, but I played tennis when I first moved here. And I primarily played at the high school, um, just because they're in such great condition and um, easy, easy access and, and open. So we definitely can do that. That's something we really would love to do at the staff level. And so and that is on the kind of not retired, but just not on the active list at the moment. And so. And that's the part that worries me. When, when I heard there's an active list, and there's an inactive list. So which one gets the most attention? Based and, on and, priorities. And, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, but things have fallen off that I thought would be a priority. I just can't think of the dark So I think that merits more discussion. Yeah, and we can definitely do that. The goal of the strategic plan is to kind of, because basically right now, you guys pass a strategic plan every single year and it's called the budget. And so ultimately, we want to have these conversations to lead into the budget document and then not make decisions mid budget that fiscally maybe make things more difficult in the parks budget specifically. Because if we did go out and make some improvements or engage bocce ball, um, that money, it, currently would be coming, it would be coming out of the parks budget. And so I think that if we can start from the planning process, we can get all of the things that you desire and we can devise our strategy on how we do that at our lowest cost through uh, the funding mechanisms that are available. Because when I do talk about being at capacity, some of these projects, I mean, we're racing this week. Retta is just racing and doing incredible with Don. I know that the priority in the past has been the critical infrastructure ordinance, which we will deliver on Tuesday. And then based off of some miscommunication with the county um, clerk, we are now on the race for um, the ballot measure information on the 21st. And then inevitably, as we get close, as we finish that off within the swimming pool project, then all of a sudden, 
just a large project opens up in time frame and then capacity wise. Um, so, but I definitely hear you. Uh, right, and part of that is a passive, and it's passive. Uh, part of that would also go for fire and an overlap for parks. Yeah, absolutely. Funding available, so there would hopefully be more funding for parks as well as the fire department. Absolutely. So yeah, we will definitely, um, I will circle back with Juliana and we'll, she came to you guys recently, I think, and expressed that she was spreading out the general plan. So that has opened up some gaps within the time frame of doing that, which is helpful to then circle back around, see the granting opportunities with CDBG or some of the planning document grants we can get to start the process on a parks master plan. I think that is so critical in the way how you would say that the parks master plan because it'll incorporate so much of this and then it's not dropping off i guess in a sense it's not dropping off the other side some of these projects won't be it's something we need to keep fresh in their minds so they don't forget but that will be part of that plan and that's when you got to look at the overall view of that so we don't want to fall off the other side though like you said we so many times have we seen things that have fallen off the other side and a few of them have we benefited from, like like I said, the community theater. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. from. laughs> yeah. But we don't want that shouldn't happen every time. And so yes, I agree. We need to keep on top of these things. It's not it's not, you know, it's a matter of principle for the what the citizens want, plain and simple. Exactly. So, yes, Mr. Uh, Floyd. Yeah, Councilwoman Smith Freeman, did I hear you say when I, I want to make sure that I heard it? Did you put in the tennis courts in there? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. good. I appreciate that was number one. Because, because I've been I've been approached so much by that. And I honestly think that we can do that for between 500,000 and a million and a quarter. So yeah. it would be something that we could do after I've yeah. asked, I've asked questions around and I've really? talked to some of our local. Oh yeah. That's a lot. Oh, oh no, so that's be a lot. Yeah. yeah, It's going to be a lot. Have you been it's going to have to be taken back down to ground it's, zero. It's, yeah, it's, it's, bad, it's, it's bad. Yeah. It's going to have to be taken back to ground zero, but, but that's, but, but that's, we use a, it so much. There's a huge element of the community. Um, you remember when we practice? I don't know if you guys were oh, here. Oh, the tournaments every, every all, all it summer. It money into the city for the tournament. Yeah. Um, I think it would be wonderful if we could do that. I saw one when I was down when my uh, my um, niece was in the hospital down in the Bay Area, and they had beautiful tennis courts in their mm -hmm. park down there, and I took pictures of it and brought that back. Of course, that was like you know, <clears throat> seven years ago, too. But I definitely think that that's really important. And the, the tennis community said that they would be happy to help fund or raise money like for matching funds that we can put in. So I do think that there's a way to do Oh, I think so too, yeah. It's a definite uh, need. And that's really what we would be seeking through that planning process is community engagement and um, validating that decision that we would invest our time and or money into that improvement rather than pickleball or, or some other item that maybe we're not aware of within the community that people would prefer to see. So I think it's just a great idea that we because we do have a lot of infrastructure that needs improvement over at Greenhorn. And so this document would basically give everyone an opportunity to prioritize that list within a master plan, which technically is the legal document on anything, any improvement we make technically should be in our master planning document. Uh, it validates that decision that we thought over a 20 year term, we were gonna do X projects within that time frame. so. And, and Mr. Ledbetter, um, for, just for my edification, um, the, the city master plan would include the city master plan for parks would include parks, but it is not going to look at a park host that that's separate that's something that you all do in there right hiring and firing a park host. Yeah, and no, we, we so, I am so kidding that that's not something that'd be like including the guy that in, that picks up garbage at on Saturdays Fridays or Saturdays and Sundays. I think we would take the parks master plan and have community buildings in there as well, or facilities. Okay, so we'd okay. be able to put the, um, uh, the theater into that document. All of, uh, I think we'd be able to put city hall into that document as well. So. I just don't want to lose it. So I don't think that we want control of it. What we want is to make certain that it's in the plan. 
Okay. Why, why would we want to? I mean, with all due respect, Councilman Smith Freeman, why do we want to dictate to the city manager and staff what's, what positions are hired and not hired? I mean, we can do that through closed session with the city manager. We can meet with the, with the city manager and say, you know, we want another policeman. We want another fireman. We want right. you to hire this person. We want you to hire up. But I mean, ultimately, it, it, I mean, I'm not saying take it away. I'm saying it, I don't see it as... It's well, not part I of guess, a master plan of, of parks within this city. Well, I, so I, I think, think uh, I just sorry to chime in, but I think that maybe you touched on something there that's interesting, uh, Council Member McCoy. Maybe in the next couple months, we can bring that position and kind of the description of that position and have a discussion within the closed session. And then um, we, we, can we, can, it, yeah. we can go from there. So I, I know that our, I will say this in open session, that our previous city manager said, to made a comment to me, he said, I am probably in, I was in my second year. And he said, um, he said, I think that the park coast has got to be the most important thing to this council. And I said, I don't think so. And he goes, you spend the most time on it. And I mean, respectfully, again, you know, he said, I said, I don't think we do spend the most time, but obviously we did. He thought yeah, we did. We, we did, did. at that point in time, because yeah. that was before you got on board too. Right. Were, were well, no, 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 we, we spent started. a lot of time. We spent a lot of time on I know. it. So I'm that's, that started before you got on board. Yeah. And same was same with what the last topic is. So um, homelessness has now been yeah. number one priority. We talked about a lot. And I just think that there are a whole lot more areas for us to spend our yeah. the five of us to spend our expertise that are Absolutely. much more important than that. Absolutely. I mean that so, that's. Is there things? Yes. Uh, we need to move forward. So okay. I know. I, I can talk fast. I'm not gonna take up a bunch of time uh, about the tennis courts. If you'll talk to Grace Bennett, uh, she has a connection for the nanotechnology and they're always looking for projects to test that on. That's how she got her uh, segment for the handicap area for the wheelchairs and stuff. And I'm pretty sure that was free. That was a grant. So nanotechnology, they've been experimenting with the product all over the United States to see how it uh, yeah. responds to things. That would cut you way back because then all you got to pay for is the right. excavation. Maybe the transportation. The excavation. Yeah. Well, you got to put in a base. You got to, you got to, you've got a base and everything. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's an option and she has all That'd that information. Yeah. Um, the other thing that wasn't discussed here and I'm not saying add it, I'm saying it's worthy of a discussion is uh, income producing stream that we have, which are businesses, sales tax, retail, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't hear anything regarding business development and outreach. And I know we pay EDC to do that, but I really don't know if they, how they do it. You know, mm -hmm. I do they just wait for people to contact them or? Well, I think did, that I that's a, I think that you raise a good point because I think that that would be part of kind of a strategic goal come, you know, January that we would start to evaluate because uh, the EDC is a vendor for us, you know, and I think that right. that is something that we could say for another time, but ultimately um, they should be a part of kind of when we put a document or a strategic plan together, we then should be focusing our engagement with them to fulfill our vision because that's how we utilize pace engineering so i think you raise a good point there okay i just want to know if you're doing outreach in other communities in the state anything advertisement wise wise across the united states that kind of thing and uh the other thing was because it takes so long to um move the uh, city properties the excess city properties through the system now, do we have any other properties that we're considering that I think we should consider That's to, um, hate to use the word, but unload so that we, we're not spending tax dollars out that we're not using property with? I think so, part of the very first item you guys heard about tonight was the FHR program. And part of that was locally, the appraisal for DWR could not be met by the local appraisers for whatever reason. And so we had to eventually seek somebody who is, I believe, coming from San Francisco that we're negotiating with right now in order to do appraisals to buy the property for the flood hazard reduction. 
And so we are tying that particular appraiser to a contract where they can appraise our, all of our properties because that's step one is that we have to appraise them. Uh, and then ultimately that would be another kind of a project that we could work on where bring the entire list and map to a future meeting. Um, you know, I would advise if it were, you know, cause I don't want to get too caught in the weeds. Cause, then I, and I do want to say this again, because I just want to make sure people are hearing it. Um, I personally am at capacity and I guess I can tell you if you are not impressed in the gallery today or sitting at the council based off of the information you heard, I will never impress you. And so this is a lot, believe me, I've worked for two other agencies and I have never seen the amount of work and projects because this is just the project list. This is not the daily routine of what we do or the engagement with the public. But I do know that that is another item that I have heard multiple council members would like to see an evaluation of our properties. And I think with this appraiser, it would not be a heavy lift to eventually get that done and possibly squeeze it into this list that based off of getting that contract. But it signed. sounds like you're already working on it. So thank you. So, well, thank you very much. And then if we can segue, cause we have some people in the public yes. here tonight that want to talk about the urban campground and so i don't know if we want to give them the opportunity first or well i think you need to go into what um we need to discuss what that means and then um to, uh, to us for one thing so the urban campsite like you said we're doing the soil and there's hopefully get money for that to get the soil removed we have gotten confirmation that the money is available uh they have requested to know what development comes after the soil removal so that's going to be, I think, um, as us as a council too, where that, you know, where that needs to go in the future. Um, so I don't know if we have that as a future discussion, but I know there's some um, some people, members of the public that would like to weigh in on some ideas too on that um, proposal. Um, I guess we need to, uh, as far as that, what the next steps are of that. So um, if, if you guys don't mind, the council doesn't mind, I'd like to hear us. So some couple of people out in the audience that would like to weigh in on some ideas and just, you know, what we'd want to go with and what they'd like to see in the future too on that. It's almost seven. So that's, that's why well, I don't need to interrupt. interruption. Yeah. So is that okay with the rest of council? Yes. yes. Okay. For me. All awesome. right. I know a couple of members of the audience would like to talk on the direction of that. So I know we have a few folks here today that we're going to kind of discuss or wanted to make some comment about the urban campground in any capacity. Yes, in any capacity. Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, sometimes I get up in here and I wonder who do I think I am for you folks to take your time and listen to what I have to say. So if any of you think the same thing, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. <laughs> um, I, I had some notes that I wrote down about two weeks ago. I wasn't coming here preparing to speak or even in, or talk. I wasn't really sure what this evening was going to be about. Um, before I get into the housing part of it, though, as far as the um, the unhoused, I'd like to comment on the pool. And I heard you mention the language that you guys are going to be preparing for the tax initiative, for lack of a better word. Um, I had a thought here that I shared with Jason here a week or so ago about how you might be able to, not only how you might be able to get this through the voters, um and get it passed but something i think is a very important and necessary addition to what this part could be i and i saw it on tv um i don't think that there's a lot of these going on in the country or the state of california or anywhere else and previously um we were kind of joking about how Wairika is a little behind the times and technology etc well i think this is an opportunity to take advantage of a, a, an opportunity, a situation, and catapult you into something that might um, be really, really cool. Um, what it was, was a all needs or special needs facility at a park. Um, I, I, I think every single person here probably knows somebody or somebody that knows somebody that has a child with special needs. I know quite a few people. I know specifically a lady that I was familiar with um, 
when I lived in Aetna, her and her husband had a uh, gentleman that was a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. He couldn't feed himself, couldn't do anything. When he was a little kid, it was no big deal. But as he grew up, um, I think he outlived his life expectancy by quite some time and he's still alive, but he's an adult man and still incapable of taking care of himself. And his mother, who's about this tall, takes this gentleman to the city pool of Aetna. I've seen her struggle with him. I witnessed, I remodeled their house. I witnessed the struggle of just giving him a shower. So in a special needs or all needs facility apart, like I'm talking about, there's something for everybody. Um, the option to put something like that in, I think is never better. Uh, it's never gonna happen again. You're looking at a, uh, what do we got? $8.5 million grant. And I think it would be a shame to uh, miss uh, a very valuable part of the community that doesn't always get the attention it deserves. So on to um, housing. As far as the urban campground, um, I guess I'm just going to share with you some thoughts that I had. And sometimes when I leave here, I just go home and take down some notes. So I kind of try and remember some of the things for some reason, if it's one or another, I don't know. I might want to recall. Um, forgive me, this wasn't meant to be a presentation. Forgive me, my notes are sloppy. I can barely my, read my own writing sometimes. Um, and I'll do my best to get out of here as fast as I can. So when it comes to the urban campground um, and in general, um, the unhoused population, and for lack of a better word, I'm gonna call the population on the street that I see on a daily basis. I see an increase in the population of what I think um, we've referred to as the bottom tier of the unhoused ladder. Uh, personally, I see this group increasing more, um, more than any other group um, in the city as far as population goes. Um, not trying to point fingers at any race, group of people, but that's just a fact of what I see. Um, every single day I see new people, and that's continuing on every day. Um, so the result of what I see happening is going to be an increase in crime, um, an increase in drugs on the street, including fentanyl, which I've heard recently has already been uh, confiscated from the street of Wairika, um, theft, assault, etc. When people who want to move to Wairika to work, raise their families or retire, um, they research these statistics. And I actually heard a gentleman two days ago who is a very prominent farmer from Scott Valley um, sold their ranch and he moved to Trinity Center and he was thinking about moving to Wairika and he decided not to because of this. Um, the solution in part is your urban campground, but looking forward, I think it needs to be more than just a campground. It needs to include not just tents, but some semi-solid structures, some mini homes and areas large enough for people to breathe. This property would include say up to 50 sites, with a common area, a dining pavilion with regular meals provided, showers, which would be a start to a healthy uh, movement and just cleanliness of the folks that I see on the street. I'm not saying that they don't want to, I just, I, it's not available. Uh, I don't see very many showers on the corner where these folks could uh, seek that part of life. <laughs> he just thought he's, he's got, um, he'll wrap it up here soon. So, so um, back to the uh, the room to breathe. Um, lost my train of thought. Uh, meals um, would provide could provide a common area, the dining pavilion with regular meals provided, showers, uh, some entertainment, a work program, a mentor program, transportation, and counseling for those that need it. Um, I think with your basic urban campground with, although it, it may be critically needed at this point in time, I don't think it's going to meet the needs of tomorrow, let alone years to come. Um, long term, uh, there will be, there will need to be a mental health facility that can provide services to the one group of individuals who would need the most help. Um, as I mentioned to a couple of gentlemen earlier, I truly have noticed that there is a drug and alcohol problem on the streets of Wairika that is far beyond what most people can comprehend. But there are also people that suffer from mental illness that are not addicted to drug and alcohol problems. So we can't just 
fix the drug and alcohol problem and expect them to go back into society and function. So I don't think that we are even coming close to reaching where we need to go to accommodate all the needs of the people that are in front of us. Um, I came across this uh, information the other day. There's 10 strategies to reduce homelessness with the American Rescue Plan. American Rescue Plan. The only reason I wrote it down is because it, it says the American Rescue Plan. There's three categories. First one is lay the groundwork, set community specific goals, cultivate political will and partnerships, ensure racial equity in the decision making, reduce administration, administrative and regulatory barriers. Uh, the next column was strengthen um, the housing system, reduce waiting periods for housing uh, placements, guarantee paths to housing from unsheltered homeless, um, recruit support and retain landlords, leverage support services competitive for classes over the last, leverage support services, competition for classes over the last 30 plus years. This was a note that I threw in, sorry. Um, leverage support services, leave it at that. Um, the next uh, category was expand the affordable housing supply, support initiative, innovation and development. And that's kind of what I'm talking about is think big, um, think beyond what um, we probably were, should have been taking care of years ago. Um, coordinate federal, state and local housing resources. I know you guys are all working on things like this. It was just an interesting list that I came across. So, in conclusion of that, um, Mr. Ledbetter has stated that he's maxed out. Uh, I don't mean to say it in those terms, but he's at capacity. The things that I see to truly solve this problem are going to take more than the city of Wairika has manpower to even begin to manage it or see it through. So who will adopt and apply themselves to see this plan through? To the council, I say this with all due respect, this was never really intended to hear your ears, it was just some thoughts. Respectfully, I heard one of you say, no disrespect to previous councils, but the can got kicked down the road and that is why where we are, why we are where we are in regards to the city pool. So when it comes to the uh, unhoused, um, be the council that future count, don't be the council that future councils say the previous council kicked the can down the road. That's why we are where we are. Don't waste much time looking in the rearview mirror and focus on the windshield and what lay ahead. Does anybody truly know how bad things are or? Jerry, what? I'm sorry. I'm going to just intervene here. Can you get to the brass tacks of the urban campground and your impression of that project? Because yes. when I've spoken to you, because we can't have everybody talk for 8, 10, 15 minutes, we, we completely understand your perspective. When it comes to the homeless issue, I am actively working on that particular project. And so, and I know we have talked, and, and so I guess I just want to kind of get to the location and the scale. Because when I talk to you, it seems like you're kind of saying, we got to scale this thing up. Yeah. So, like I said, I wasn't prepared to come here to do this. So, um, in, in realizing that the property that the city has allocated for this project is not going to fit the needs of the future, I took it upon myself to drive around and look at other properties. There are not very many properties in Wairika that you are going to find that will fit something that I'm talking about. I found a place just barely north of um, Grocery Outlet. It's a hill property. Um, with development potential that blocks the view of um, what we're talking about from the general public. You got a freeway on one side and a creek on the other side and the city sewer ponds on the other side. There's literally ways to block this development from the, the public eye or make it appealing to the public eye. Um, once a development goes into a place like this, that's big enough to house what we need now with room to grow into the future, there's one category of people that are not being addressed and that's the mentally ill. So long-term, I think that Wairika should be thinking about what it's gonna take to solve the problem of not just the homelessness that you see within the city limits on a daily basis, but what's coming in from outside the area on a daily basis. You're gonna be flooded with things that we haven't seen yet. The facility that I'm seeing handles the all of it 
from the people that are able to be rehabbed into a work program and then a long-term facility for um, people that have mental illness that will never be able to enter into society without care and medication. Um, is there anything else, Mr. Ledbetter? No, and I guess I'm going to just kind of consolidate kind of my understanding because we've talked on multiple Absolutely. occasions and I am not trying to be like a negative person no. here with you, but so I'm just going to regurgitate what you said in a different way. But ultimately what I am hearing is you are looking for a plan yes. to be put together that kind of goes in with the continuum of care on a long range and not kind of a one-off project because it's going to take multiple projects. And so basically what you're saying is you don't think that the size of the current urban campground is uh, efficient enough. I think that as you are preparing to meet your immediate needs with the current urban campground, you should already be looking for the next location. Okay, that is I, perfect. I, I tend to agree with Jerry. We, we need to dream a little bit bigger and better. And I think there's other programs that we need to uh, dip into to look at what a bigger picture would be on homelessness because it's it's going to be something that's going to be ongoing for a while until um, the state and federal level starts putting money into it with they where they need to in mental health facilities and stuff like that where it's going to be a bigger battle and what Jerry's leading to is that bigger picture a bigger yeah. picture for the 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 part of the category that's really not getting touched right now and that is the individuals that don't want that help that are in an area that um, won't get that help. And that's what he's talking about is to, to hit the bigger picture on how we can address those. So basically what we're looking at is, and this is something we got to think of in the near future, how do we address that and where do we move forward with that? And when we're looking at the strategic planning, that is something that's maybe we're not looking big enough into and because and it's other cities have started this process and have not taken it to a large enough level and they've paid the price for it because of that. You and guys are in an opportunity to get ahead of that. Or exactly. Other point. Exactly. And so we've, he's yeah. trying, he's looking at it as preventing to prevention of what the other bigger cities are going through right now. And yeah. we can, that's something we need to look into as a, as a council is how we can move forward with that. And I think that's, Kind of more sums it up. I don't think you've had the severity of the problem that some of the bigger cities have, but I think you're going to have it. Yep. And, and Mr. Stocker, so we'll we'll be in touch because I'm going to include you with our conversations with Dr. Collard as we move forward to kind of draft the larger plan. Yeah. Because first and foremost, it comes down to uh, what money is available, yeah. and so and then an operator. But we've talked about this yeah. in, ad nauseum offline. Yeah. We will continue to do that, my friend. And so I will incorporate you into my next meeting with and her. And it's not just about the money, about what's available now, but what you're going to need down the road. Down the road, yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. It's about a long-term plan. Yep. But I kind of want to veer back into the nuts and bolts of what the vision is, because I need to kind of better understand the urban campground. And really, 7 o'clock, I wanted to get through this, get through the strategic planning side. But I do have some other folks in the audience that have talked to me and I think would like to possibly communicate their um, their feelings about the urban campground. So this would be the appropriate time if anybody yes. else wants to come up and, and just make a statement. It's fine. If not, that's totally acceptable, too. But <laughs> and please, uh, if you can, state your name and where you're from, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. My name is Jody Sabies and I am a Siskiyou County resident. I also have worked on South Foothill Drive for 22 years now. I work for the Siskiyou County Department of Agriculture and I've watched that area go from a safe place to work. We have buildings on both sides of the street and to be a very safe place to work. And now it's not so much. We get a tremendous amount of foot traffic and other kinds of traffic um, from homeless and, and drug element, um, mental health individuals, not only down the street in between the buildings, but also the um, what used to be the railroad, railroad yeah. and behind. That has become a huge thoroughfare. That is exactly where this encampment is um, going to be. 
prior to the building going in next door to where this encampment is, it was opened up to homeless and there were multiple tents put up and we watched a lot of activity, uh, not only drug activity, but also um, uh, activity that, that the public coming in and out of our office didn't like also. Oh yes, many times. <laughs> Not to mention um, using the street side as um, a restroom and those types of things. In the past five years, the break-ins and the amount of theft that's happened in our office has increased exponentially. And in the past couple of years, we have, and most recently in the past couple of months, we have needle issues constantly um, right at our doors. Our doors going into our facilities, our back doors going into our offices. And so with this encampment, we see or we are going to ask you who is going to be managing this encampment? How is the encampment going to be um, encompassed so that individuals that are currently uh, on drugs, alcohol, uh, mental health issues, how is that going to be managed so that people, the public, we have a lot of public that come to our offices, not to mention our staff that work there. And the, and the theft, obviously you know that our budget is just as, as impacted as everybody else's and to constantly have to figure out how we're going to replace things that have been stolen, vandalized, broken, cut, dismantled because they're trying to find um, money or things to sell. It has been difficult. So that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I'd like to, to portray to you as to, uh, I don't live on that street, but I spend most of my waking hours there. And, and so do my coworkers. And we just wanted to let you know that. With that, um, when the pool project was first introduced, I was on board, I went to the meetings. I thought it was awesome. Until the location across the freeway was added as the location. And this is why. The, it, the central exit of I-5 is where Children and families have to cross to get to the other side by foot, by bicycle. However, all summer long, sometimes later in the evenings, sometimes later in um, it gets dark in November, that facility is still going to be open. And at five o'clock, it's going to be dark. I-5 is a human trafficking corridor. And we're going to have kids back and forth right there through that corridor. That's a concern for me. Not to mention, right next door, there will be a new homeless encampment with um, people of, you know, that are taking drugs and or uh, mental health issues. And, and, and you have that nexus of children in that corridor. Plus, I, what I'm hearing and I don't know specifics, but the new swim facility is supposed to be open to everyone. There is not a, a fee or, or to that effect. Is that correct? Correct. That's the way the grant was written. I, okay. Okay. Then, then that means that those same individuals that um, that currently yell at me when I'm trying to cross <laughs> to my office from office to office or um, leave needles uh, in front of the door are going to be attending the same pool in the same facility that our children are. And, and that's difficult. I understand there needs to be a facility. There truly does need to be a facility. There needs to be help for people. Um, and I really appreciate the work that you have put into creating a city and county nexus to deal with this situation. I know <laughs> that is absolutely, um, it's monumental. And, and I appreciate all of your work that you're doing there. 
I really do believe that there's a way to refurb our current swimming pool. One, it would be less expensive. Two, it is a better location for the children of our community. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I have questions I can answer those. But no funding, but no funding. But, but, I'm sorry, what? But no funding for the pool. That, they won't true. turn that location, we tried. They can call down and try, yep. they won't give us the money. Hi. Thank, thank My name you. is William Goodpasture. Everybody calls me Bill. Um, I live on South Wairica. Everything she said, absolutely true. Worse at night. I moved up here about almost three years ago from Sacramento. And I lived in Carmichael. I watched what you guys are doing happen in Carmichael. I mark Carmichael used to be a very beautiful place to live. High-end homes. Um, it's just... My grandfather built a house there in 1952. It's still there. It's still under a good pasture name. And it's riddled with homeless. And that's the outside states or, or the outside cities are pushing their homeless towards Carmichael because they want a soccer belt ball field. They want something new. Um, as a resident of that street, I kind of feel like that maybe you guys should, if you're going to go through with this, you should probably offer us some kind of you know out i have two small children i didn't know this was happening when i moved here during the daytime it's great we came down here for almost a month uh researching the town and it's great during the day during the night it's not i'm a tow truck driver before that i worked for honorheim and i was a um, service mechanic I see it at night all the time. Um, my 13 year old stepdaughter was accosted by uh, one of the homeless people at the 76. Uh, she no longer, when she comes and visits, she no longer wants to go out of the house. Uh, it's not a good place. We're trying to find another place. As you all know, there's not a lot of places to rent in Byrica. I now work at Bruce's Towing, so I have to be at, at in Byrica. Uh, I agree with her about the pool. That's, it's just a terrible spot. Um, I, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that you can put into moving that contaminated dirt from the, um, from the, uh, the train station, I, I just see it as a waste of money, personal. Um, if there's no resources there for these people, I'm a firm believer in the people that want to get off the streets and they need the people with the mental health and most definitely our veterans. Because a lot of our veterans don't, uh, they don't trust the government anymore. They came back from war and they're, they're hurt. They don't trust. Um, when I did talk to the Hope House, because literally they're catty corner from my house, um, they say they're opening in no, probably late November. Um, they don't want you guys to put a, an encampment behind them. That's what they're telling me. Um, they are very worried that whatever happens with these homeless people, it's gonna come back on them, which I'm gonna tell you it will, because down in Sacramento, don't know if you've ever been down ba Banner Street, that's what they did there. And everybody gets caught by fishes and loaves, they blame it on fishes and low. They blame it on the, um, oh, this. <laughs> I can't think of the name of them now. Uh, Salvation Army. Um, there's another church that's there. And they always get blamed that they're bringing all those homeless people in. And they even put a police department. If you ever go there, right on Richards, there is the police department. And it doesn't stop them. They just sit out there and do drugs. I used to be a tow truck driver down there as well. I took a lot of scrap cars to Sims Metal and I'd have to drive through all of them every day, at least three or four times a day. Um, I don't know where you would put them. <laughs> my idea is, my idea would be if that's if you're just dead set on that place, there's only four houses there. And I can tell you where the problems are because I live there. Um, I just towed a motorcycle, stole a motorcycle from 
some people to live down further than I do. Um, it's just, I mean, it's four houses. And I have a feeling that Michelle Hill owns all of them. I don't know if she does or not. I know she owns three. But it might be wise of the city to buy the houses. Then you can have buildings that you can, instead of doing all that dirt work, you know, because you're, you're talking about moving a lot of dirt. And I, I've run construction sites and stuff like that. I, I know what you're in for with moving contaminated dirt. It's not just, let's just go pick it up and pile it somewhere. That's not what it is. And we all know that. Um, but anyway, the, I would think the wisest thing is, would be to turn it into a complete, um, complete the, the um, commercialization of the area. And then you have, you already have structures that are there that you can house mental, uh, mental health people that can come in on certain days and whatnot. The old junkyards there, uh, that's a large building that could be refurbished. Um, I still am a firm believer of having it somewhere that's closer to the mental health because that, that's going to help. If they're close, and I put it to, to you like this, they're going to come out of there. It's just like going and rounding up a bunch of deer and expecting them all to stay in one spot. They're not going to do it. The sad part is, is that when you Google Wairika, which I've done many times, you get off on 775. You get off at 76. And the first thing you see at night is what I like to call the bridges on fire. You just see smoke coming up from underneath the bridge because that's where all the home, where a bunch of the homeless people are. Um, Bruce is towing. I feel bad for Scott. Uh, I've been out there trying to help him since I started employment there. Um, he's inundated with motorhomes that these home, homeless people are leaving. And it, it, it's bad enough that we're out there having to do it with picks and destroy these things so that we can actually get rid of them or Bruce's towing can get rid of them. Um, it's not fair to us because they can just leave the leave the motor home. But I really think that it needs to be, you guys have to have a vetting process. And I don't think that that, I don't, from what I understand from listening and I watch it, watch your videos on YouTube of the town meetings. This is the first time I've been here. Um, but I really think there needs to be a vetting process and some of the worser cases need to be shipped over to the bigger towns. Uh, they, they can go to, there's a bus that can take them to, to um, Reading where they have better services for them. Um, Oregon, I can tell you right now, from some of the people that I, I, I have met and came encounter with, I think they're all trying to migrate to Oregon because you know that's the new Amsterdam and you know, they just get stuck here. So, but a lot of them, I also have, my wife has a uh, brother that's homeless. He was stabbed six times. We brought him home, healed him up. I looked at him. I said, whatever you want to do, man, what schooling do you want to go? You don't have to worry about living. I'll pay for everything. Let's get you off your, this guy is a phenomenal welder. He can weld anything. We got him healed up. He went for a visit with his aunt in Woodland, California, and was gone. And he's back on the street. And that is a condition that once they have gone to the street for so long, they will stay there. They don't know anything else. They don't know any better. And it is an illness that they have. And some of them just enjoy it that way. I hear about the guy that's up in the mountains that's got gold rocks. That's just... I got gold rocks. He's a happy dude. He comes down here, gets his groceries, goes back up to the mountain. I'm totally cool with that guy. He can stay up there. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that's where I'm at. I don't want to take too, too much time. I'm actually on call right now. But, um, anyhow, I think there should be a vetting process. As a resident there, I, I'm, I'm disappointed in it. I'm disappointed in Michelle Hill because she told me that, you know, they they didn't give me no information about that house because, like I said, I have a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old and another 13-year-old daughter that comes to me. If I had known, I would have never rented that house. I spent a little under $10,000 moving there, and that was a lot of money to save, a lot of money for me. I'm not a rich guy. Um, and now I'm to the point where I have to 
figure out what I'm going to do. I, I can't have my, my kids. I can't let them grow up around those people. I mean, and I'm not saying those people, that sounds really bad, but I, right now I can't, uh, my wife was just calling the cops on yesterday on a, a lady uh, that looked like she was on drugs rummaging through our neighbor's truck. And granted the, the PD is great. They, they came right out and they dealt with the situation, but there's only so much PD and sheriff's department can actually do, you know, um, and that's unfortunate. And uh, you guys are you guys are kind of the end all of it because you know from what I understand it's still illegal to panhandle in front of businesses, and that that's the one I don't see is that you know because I go into the seventy six all the time, tow truck driver you got to eat, and uh, there's always somebody out there and I see the 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 new seventy six down there I see them running them off constantly. There's a lady at the Valero, the really nice lady. And she stands out there when they're hanging out and she just shoes them on their way. It's, you can't stay here. You can't do this. And uh, if she gets cursed at, she gets yelled at. And the thing that, that a town is beautiful. The thing that I have a problem with is when you come into town, I was telling my wife this the other day, you come into town and you stop at the 76 or usually the 773, where everybody, where everything is. The first thing you look at is, oh, this is a really nice town. Yeah. Got any change? You know, and, and that's that's not a projection of that's, what we yeah, want to be. Because I would, other issue. Yeah. my wife is, her family's in the cloud. And uh, I wanted to make this my home. You know, I know I'm a, I'm a what they call a transplant, but, you know, I'm, I like small towns. I lived in Earrington, Nevada for five years and it was wonderful there. I loved it. And I had my choice, go back there or stay or come here. And my wife was like, I need to be next to my family. So here we are. Anyhow, I'm sorry that it took so long, no, that's but good. Um, those are my concerns. I still think that the city should offer something towards the families that are there. Cause they're there. I think there's three of us now. Yeah. Um, offer something of, to us to help us get out and get away from these people. Um, the ones down at the very end, I don't know. They're probably totally happy with it. So I don't know if they are, but there's a lot of motorhomes down there. Yeah. No, it's definitely. <laughs> so, well, thank, thank you for that input. You know, it's there's a lot the, that's to be said on that sort of thing because there is a lot going on and we all need uh, input on that. Yes, Mr. I want to thank you for your idea of vetting because that is yes. something that we've discussed of vetting people and and we have looked at the models that they have in Medford and the police vet them and they're not admitted into the homeless camp unless, unless the police vet them. Yep. Right. So there are, but I appreciate that. The other thing I would address is that the city, I, I believe the city council probably in the next four years will address the, the idea of panhandling. Panhandling is legal in Wairica. Is it's, it? Yes, and it's legal oh. in most cities in California. I didn't know that. Yes. Hey, I, yes. I, what I meant by when they call it pan, about pandering mm -hmm. is pandering. when you're doing it in front of a business. Pandering legally is a whole different thing. Right, than right. Exactly. right. But, I, I misspoke on that pandering. It's, the way, it's when you're doing it in front of the business. The way Medford handled it, and I like it, I can't speak for my fellow councilmen and councilwomen, but what happens is they, they have a law and if you pull up to a stop sign and you reach out of your window to give them something, you're the one that gets a ticket. Exactly. Right. And, and then and because that... you're not going to get anything out of the person panhandling, but what it has done for the police department, what they have said, it's not, there's, there's no cure all, but it has taken probably 50% or a little bit more of the people that would panhandle off the streets because they're not getting anything. So I think they're both what you brought up are great ideas and I appreciate yeah. them. Thank you. No no getting no. getting to the line of that. And, and I think it's worth us. Uh, right. You know, I think we're all listening to you. Getting, we'll, getting to the lines really. of that. It's, a, it's a, yeah. actually obstruction of, of traffic is what it is, yeah. is right. what they, is what they emphasized on and not necessarily the panhandling yeah. of that. It's obstruction of, and what it comes down to on a lot of those situations, just so you know, is it comes down to the businesses wanting to do something about that. Right. It doesn't come down to law enforcement. Law enforcement will, will enforce what the businesses will ask them to enforce. It right. is already legally already there, but that's a whole other issue. Right, so right, right. anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. No I appreciate problem. that. Appreciate, appreciate you guys yeah, listening to it. And I, I will just um, 
make a suggestion depending on whether or not we have more public comment but since we really fulfilled the goals of today for the purpose of the meeting and i feel like i have direction at the moment for soil removal with dtsc at that specific site uh, i can seek clarification on the next steps at a future meeting while we go through that contract in order to uh, we'll be back here on tuesday for an actual city council meeting and so I do want to stay functional. Obviously, we'll let Mr. Love here have his public comment, but my suggestion is, is that uh, we adjourn after that. Yes, please. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Lorenzo Love, 4th Street. Um, yeah, this uh, camp for the concentration of the homeless is just a token effort. Uh, this is just something so you can say you did something. It's going to be totally ineffective. Uh, all right, another subject, the pool. What are you realistically going to get for eight and a half million dollars? It's not going to be this, this Taj Mahal in the grant proposal. It's not going to be anything remotely like that. You're going to have something much smaller, much simpler. And what is the California Parks going to do about that when you turn in this design for something not like the grant proposal, not remotely like the grant proposal. Are they gonna want their money back? I would. And even if you design something that's supposed to come in at $8.5 million, it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be overruns. It's gonna go over budget. If it's 25% over budget, that's $2 million. Where, where are you going to get $2 million? Which one of these programs are you going to cancel for that? Be realistic about how much this pool is going to cost you, how much it's going to harm the city. Thank you, Mr. Love. All right. Well, then this stage, I think we've pretty much hit all the topics and went over this. And like I said, it's obviously going to be coming back on certain things, certain things like you said, the dirt removal and some of these other things we're obviously going to readdress. And, uh, and then hopefully um, the new council too, at that point too, on some of these, we'll be moving forward on some other issues too. So we'll probably make a partial new list at that point in time too. But I think we had some good input from the public too on some stuff because it's we do need to address these things and it's things that uh, mean a lot to a lot of the citizens and and as far as that goes it's not over Mr. Love you're right there's we will need to address these um, swimming pool issue on that because it's times have changed um, building cost of, has escalated and so it's something that will have to be addressed so feel fuel fuel everything yeah, else yeah. and that's what that comes down with a lot of these things that we're going to have to relook at and, and address as far as the urban campsite and maybe be something we have to look at and changing and doing something different on it too so there's there's a lot of the issues that we're going to be readdressing and maybe looking at a bigger picture so uh, thank you everybody appreciate your input and we will be talking to everybody soon meeting adjourned Thank you.